Committee will come to order uh, without uh, objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on oversight of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Thank the gentleman. We begin the, today's hearing with, uh, as we normally do, with opening statements, and then we'll get right to our witness. And we appreciate Ms. Khan being with us, uh, uh, Chair Khan being with us today. Um, at a speech in Berlin in 2022, Chair Khan told an audience that the challenges facing antitrust today were, quote, the result of a choice made 40 years ago to follow the misguided philosophy of people like Robert Bork. In other words, according to Chair Khan, the prevailing view over the last 40 years, a bipartisan view, shared over more than 20 Congresses, six presidential administrations, and adopted and developed by all 50 states in their enforcement is now somehow wrong. Consider that over those 40 years, the U.S. economy grew from about a $3 trillion annual economy to $25 trillion and was the single greatest period of wealth creation in human history. But everyone who oversaw economic policy for those four decades, according to the chair, was wrong. She knows better. She's trying to usher in a radical departure from the norms that made the American economy great to a system where her and her cronies have unchecked power over business practices in our country, untethered from any reasonable reading of precedent or statutory law. So if we should ask now, over the two years into her tenure, how has her approach to antitrust been playing out as she heads one of those critical agencies in our government? The short answer is that it's been a disaster. She's pushed investigations to burden parties with vague and costly demands without any substantive follow through or frankly logic for the requests themselves. She centralized the decision making at the commission within her office, eliminated any pretext of due process or transparency in that decision making. Her approach is best characterized as one of intimidation followed by inaction. The best example of this, which was only brought to light because of our work on the weaponization select committee was her targeted harassment of Twitter. After Ms. Mr. Musk bought the company in following pressure from Democrat senators, left-wing activist groups. The FTC issued over 350 requests for information from Twitter. These requests included asking for every communication about Mr. Musk inside the company, and most troubling, for information about Twitter's work with journalists, working to shed light on governments, on the government-driven censorship practices that existed at, and I think in some cases still exist at big tech. In fact, we got a great court decision last week who talked about this, how pervasive this effort was, and a preliminary injunction from that federal court in the Western District of Louisiana. Just this morning, though, in a filing in federal court, we have learned that the situation is actually even worse than we could have imagined. This wasn't harassment, it was a shakedown. The FTC, as is, as is common practice pursuant to the consent order, required Twitter to hire an independent assessor, an independent assessor whose legal obligation is to be truly independent and objective, not for one party or another. Well, it turns out objectivity was not what the Federal Trade Commission was interested in here. Here's what the filing said about Ernst & Young, the independent assessor hired in this matter. Quote, the FTC was so adamant with Ernst & Young conveying that this is absolutely what you will do, and this is going to occur, and you'll produce a report at the end of the day that would be negative about Twitter, that senior Ernst & Young leaders feared that if Ernst & Young resigned as the independent assessor, the FTC would take exception to their withdrawal and create other challenges for Ernst & Young over time. This is not conjecture from Twitter. This is from sworn testimony of the independent assessor in the deposition itself, taken just last month. This is outrageous, this is unacceptable, and it's the kind of behavior that occurs in banana republics, not in the United States of America. And so it's no wonder Chair Khan has no interest in providing information to the people's representatives in the Congress, to the people on this committee when we ask for it. To date, the FTC has not fully complied with a single request for documents from this committee. And because of her mismanagement, not even her own staff is impressed with Chairman Khan's leadership. 
In 2020, the last year under Trump, the Trump administration, 87% of FTC employees agreed that senior leaders maintain high standards. Under Chair Khan, that figure fell to 53% in 2021, has declined even further to 49% in 2022. In 2020, 83% of surveyed FTC employees agreed that, that they have a high level of respect for the FTC senior leaders. Again, under the chairman, that figure plummeted to 49%. And these numbers were before it was revealed recently that the chair was advised by FTC's Ethics Council to recuse herself from a major case. She did not recuse herself and then appears to have misled Congress about taking that advice. We have a lot of questions today to get through. We look forward to the response from the chairman of the FTC. And with that, I would yield to the gentleman from New York, the ranking member, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, since you brought up uh Robert Bork, I must say that I have thought for the last 40 years that, Robert, that the court's unfortunate following of Robert Bork's doctrines, upending all prior understandings of, uh, of antitrust law, has resulted in a, in, in, a, in a terrible misinterpretation of antitrust law and is directly responsible for the overconcentration of industry and the power of big business in today's economy. Mr. Chairman, Yesterday, the director of the FBI sat at the witness table for nearly six hours, enduring a steady stream of baseless attacks and conspiracy theories meant to fit a far-right narrative that may resonate on Fox News, but that lacks any basis in fact. Today, it is the chair of the Federal Trade Commission's turn to step into the alternate universe that is the House Judiciary Committee under MAGA Republican leadership. Chair Khan, the last time you were here, you sat on this side of this table, helping to reinvigorate this committee's work on antitrust matters, and I thank you for your service to the committee. Unfortunately, I expect that today you will be the target of a barrage of personal attacks and wild accusations about the work of the FTC under your leadership. Republicans will tell us that the commission is wasting resources, but the FTC has returned over $430 million to consumers under your watch and is vigorously enforcing the laws that Congress has entrusted to it. Meanwhile, it is the House Republicans who have wasted untold congressional and staff and agency staff resources and millions of dollars in pursuing a fruitless search for evidence of misconduct at the FTC. The majority will also argue that the FTC's investigation into Twitter was politically motivated and conducted at the behest of congressional Democrats. This argument also has no basis in fact. Twitter has been in trouble for failing to adequately protect the privacy of its users for more than a decade. It has been subject to a consent decree on this topic since as far back as 2011. It came under a second consent decree last year, and given the haphazard conduct of its new owner, it may very well be subject to new scrutiny today. It is the FTC's duty to review compliance with these consent decrees, particularly when, as occurred last year, there are credible concerns that user data may have been compromised when the majority of its legal and engineering staff was fired. This work has nothing to do with the new owner of the company and his political views. Protecting user privacy is not political. Rushing to defend a company at all costs and investigating the agency that attempts to hold that, count, that company accountable merely because the new owner shares your political views is another matter. Ultimately, Chair Khan, you will face attacks today because you are doing your job. And that is what threatens Republicans the most. The Federal Trade Commission was created and charged with enforcing antitrust and competition laws to respond to a rise in consolidation across the market in the early 1900s. It helped bring down the trusts and lessen monopoly power, which strengthened the economy and helped support the formation of a strong middle class. Unfortunately, in recent decades, the executive branch took a radical turn away from enforcement of the antitrust laws that kept us safe and prosperous for nearly a century. That failure led to massive consolidation across the market that gave rise to a handful of dominant companies with the power to squash, to squash competition. The rise of monopolies and monopsonies in several fields was a boon to the corporate class, but it has been devastating to consumers, workers, and small businesses. This began to change when the Biden administration announced several steps to 
to reinvigorate the enforcement of federal antitrust laws. By faithfully interpreting the original intent of the antitrust laws and the FTC Act to ensure fair competition and prices, the administration has announced that the party is over for large and unfettered corporations. And although most Americans welcome this change, and indeed our economy is booming and unemployment is at a historic low, the commitment to enforcing these laws has raised alarm among our Republican colleagues, so they have taken aim at your agency and the important work the FTC does to protect consumers and promote competition. I hope that my Republican colleagues will find it within themselves to put their baseless and often personal attacks on pause long enough to listen to the importance of your mission. In any event, I appreciate your, here, uh, your appearing here today, and I appreciate the valuable work of the FTC. I look forward to your testimony, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back without objection. All of the opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's witness, the Honorable Lena Khan. Ms. Khan is the chair of the Federal Trade Commission. She was sworn in on June uh, 15, 2021. We welcome our witness and thank her for appearing here today. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury uh, that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you, God. Uh, let the record reflect the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you. And um, uh, please know that your written testimony, uh, you've, you've seen this before, even you sat back behind the, the chairman before, or the former chairman before. So um, uh, that your written testimony will be entered in the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony uh, in, in five minutes. We'll, we'll be a little uh, lax with that if you need a few extra. Um, but Chair Khan, you may begin, and then we'll, then we'll move to questions. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. I am glad to join you to discuss the FTC's work to promote fair competition and protect Americans from unfair and deceptive practices. It's a particular honor to appear before this committee, where I had the great privilege of serving during its historic bipartisan investigation into digital markets and the power of large technology platforms. As this committee knows well, there has long been a battle in this country between monopoly power and America's democratic institutions. Congress created the FTC in 1914 against the backdrop of an industrial revolution that had delivered significant uh, technological advances, but also enabled intense consolidation. Given deep national unease about the unchecked power that these monopolists could wield, lawmakers tasked the FTC with preventing unfair methods of competition and scrutinizing business practices through regular data collection and continuously building expertise. In the subsequent years, Congress has expanded our legislative mandate to include laws aimed at protecting consumers. With each of these efforts, Congress has redoubled its commitment to fair competition and to rooting out unfair or deceptive business practices. At the FTC, our North Star is fulfilling the important mandate that Congress has given us and doing all that we can to faithfully enforce the laws and safeguard America's citizens and businesses from harmful and even dangerous concentrations of private power that characterize significant swaths of our economy today. I am endlessly impressed by the talent and tenacity of the FTC teams, especially in the face of ongoing resource constraints and legal challenges to our authorities. Over the past 24 months, the FTC has moved to challenge major transactions that would have eroded competition in critical sectors of the economy, including defense, semiconductors, energy, digital markets, and pharmaceuticals. We are tackling anti-competitive practices, including those that harm American farmers, small businesses, and workers. Last year, the FTC and a bipartisan coalition of 10 state attorneys general charged the two largest pesticide manufacturers with unlawful schemes that prevented farmers from having access to cheaper products, costing them billions of dollars. In January, the FTC proposed a rule that would ban employers from imposing non-compete restrictions that lock in workers and collectively depress their wages by up to $300 billion, while also depriving startups and businesses of the employees they need to expand and compete. In the months since proposing this rule, we've received over 21,000 public comments, including from nurses and doctors, fast food workers, and hairdressers, who all, all told us about how non-competes had hurt their livelihoods and undermined their economic liberty. 
Already, several enforcement actions by the FTC have led firms to drop non-compete restrictions imposed on thousands of workers. The FTC also continues to use its tool to conduct market-wide inquiries. Last June, the Commission launched an inquiry into the practices of pharmacy benefits managers to shed light on the opaque operations of these large middlemen who can dictate pricing and access to life-saving drugs for millions of Americans. This inquiry follows thousands of public comments the FTC received explaining the real-life costs that can follow from PBM's current practices. One doctor, for example, recounted how delays in PBM approvals caused her patient to develop resistance to an otherwise effective treatment, ultimately leading to the needless loss of her patient's eye. In addition to these critical areas of work, we are redoubling our efforts to protect Americans' privacy and combat fraud, while also activating additional authorities that Congress has given us. We've brought actions to protect consumers from made in USA fraud, protect military families from predatory financing, and protect addiction recovery patients from deception. We are fighting to protect the security of people's sensitive personal data and have obtained record monetary judgments, including the largest ever judgment to protect children's privacy. The Commission has also proposed rules to address some of the most widespread scams, like government impersonation fraud, made in USA fraud, and fake online reviews. The agency is tackling junk fees plaguing American consumers and scrutinizing dark patterns that trick people into incurring unwanted charges or surrendering sensitive data. Our click to cancel proposal would require companies to make it as easy to cancel a subscription as it is to sign up for one. The FTC is also committed to fighting for people's right to repair their own products. The FTC has brought several major actions against companies for imposing unlawful repair restrictions, hurting customers and independent shops alike. In other words, the FTC is firing on all cylinders, fighting every day to protect the American people from unlawful business practices. These efforts reflect the extraordinary work of our agency's staff, whose talent and dedication are second to none. It is a deep honor to serve in this role, and I am enormously proud to see how our enforcement actions and policy work are materially helping Americans in their day-to-day -day lives. In the aggregate, our work helps promote the open, competitive, resilient markets that have been the bedrock of America's economic success and dynamism throughout our nation's history. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I am happy to answer your questions. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we will now move to five-minute questions. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming. Like other federal agencies, the FTC has a designated agency ethics official known as DAO. On April 18th, 2023, you testified before a subcommittee of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. At the hearing, Chair Rogers asked you, quote, are there any instances where you have not followed the DAO's advice, end quote. You responded no, and you followed up by saying that you, quote, have consulted with the DAO and taken actions that are consistent with the legal statements that DAO has made, end quote. On June 16, 2023, a Bloomberg journalist published a leaked memoranda written by the FTC's DAO analyzing Chair Khan's ability to sit as a judge in the FTC's review of Meta's acquisition of a company called Within. According to the ethics memoranda, the DAO, quote, recommended you recuse to avoid an appearance of partiality concern pursuant to federal ethics regulations. Do you believe that you were completely honest and forthcoming with Congress when you asked if there were, quote, any instances where you had not followed the DAO's advice and you answered no? Yes or no? Yes, Congresswoman. Okay. In the letter that you sent to this committee yesterday evening, you claimed that you received only oral advice from the DAO but never saw the leaked memo until after you decided not to recuse yourself. First, it is unbelievable to me that you would not ask for written ethics advice on this particular topic. You admit that you have, written, you, have you have written ethics advice on other topics, but on this topic you claim you did not see the written memo. Instead, you want us to believe that you only received oral advice and not specific oral advice, but only general advice on, quote, understanding the legal framework, end quote. Did DAO give you advice that is different than what was written in the, in the memoranda? Thanks for the question, Congresswoman. So my work before I joined the commission was focused on assessing the power of large technology I need you companies. to answer the question that I asked. I, I mean, the question that I asked was, did you receive different oral advice than what was written in the memoranda from DAO? 
So I Very simple question. So I consulted with the ethics official. The ethics official, uh, as was noted in the memo that you cited, although I did not receive that memo, noted that the ultimate framework for instances in which somebody has no financial conflicts of interest. Did she give no you different oral advice than what was in the written memoranda? The legal framework yes or is no. For the employee to themselves determine whether they should or should not recuse. Okay. Uh, that Did was she give you different advice than what was it orally than was in the written memoranda? Yes or no? Congressman, as was noted in the written memoranda, there was no ethics violation created by my participating but in the But you didn't matter. follow the DAO's advice, did you? You could have recused at any time, couldn't you? I followed the determination that there was no ethics you could violation. Have re you could have recused at any time, couldn't you? There was no violation under the ethics laws because I have not a penny in financial stock not a penny in financial interest. The DAO gave you the advice to, to recuse, companies. and you did not do so, correct? Congresswoman, the, as was noted in the memo, as I noted in I'm the letter. I'm going to move on, since you're not willing to answer my question. Um, I read your four-page letter, which was nothing more than a front to your obligations of honesty, integrity, and candor before this tri tribunal that is owed by every public servant. And I would reference part 2635 of the Code of Federal Regulations, which describes your ethics standards. I want to note that the ethics standards are actually higher than one owed by lawyers, which brings me to my next point. Do you expect lawyers at the FTC to follow federal ethics rules? Of course, everybody at the federal... Do you expect lawyers at the FTC to be an active member in good standing of a bar of a U.S. state? If they're practicing as a lawyer, they need to be in good standing with the okay. relevant I, bar rules. I understand that you were admitted to the New York bar on July 16, 2020, but in 2019 and 2020, according to your Senate questionnaire, you held yourself out as counsel for the Democrats on this very committee. You used this title, but you were not licensed to practice law. Counsel is a term reserved for lawyers, licensed lawyers. And in Wyoming, a person who in any manner holds themselves as competent to practice law without a license to do so is guilty of unauthorized practice of law. I believe the law in the District of Columbia where you held yourself out is, is similar. Do you believe it is appropriate for non-lawyers to claim the title of counsel? Uh, Congressman, when I had the honor to work for this committee, I complied with all of the document requests that the HR folks requested including documentation about the fact when that I, I checked your registration status this morning I learned that you are not in good standing with the New York bar your license is listed as delinquent which means you have failed to file your biennial registrations and it means that you have not been paying your bar dues completing your continuing legal education and maintaining your law license I believe it's shown on the uh, on, on, on the, the the screen it also means you're subject to referral for disciplinary action. I find this situation to be stunning and a reflection on your ethics. With that, I yield back. General Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member from New York for five minutes of question. I find the statement of the general lady from Wyoming uh, incredible. Uh, will the Republican staff all commit to recusing themselves from any matters that relate to their work on the committee? Because that is a standard they are holding Chair Khan to. Chair Khan, thank you for coming before our committee today. Under your tenure, the Commission has returned over $430 million to consumers and proposed a ban on non-compete agreements that would increase workers' earnings by nearly $300 billion a year, would save consumers up to $148 billion in health care costs, and would close racial and gender wage gaps by between 3.6 and 9.1 percent. What are some other ways that the Commission supports a strong economy? Thanks for the question, Congressman. So, our work on the antitrust side is focused on ensuring robust competition. Uh, this has involved blocking mergers that we believed would have eroded competition, uh, including in the defense industry, including in healthcare. Uh, we've brought a set of lawsuits uh, alleging that certain types of hospital mergers would have deprived Americans of access to quality, affordable health care. Uh, we have a whole set of work underway focused on the fact that all too often Drug prices are way too expensive for American people, and we're scrutinizing the ways in which potentially unlawful practices may be contributing to those high prices. Uh, we're also hearing directly, day in, day out, from small businesses, from independent grocers, independent pharmacists, franchisees, about the ways in which the FTC's work can help ensure that they have a robust 
open opportunity to compete in the marketplace and make sure that Americans are benefiting from robust competition. Thank you. And uh, you have made it clear that antitrust enforcers like your own agency must be more active in enforcing the law and bringing high impact cases, even if those cases ultimately are unsuccessful. Can you expand on this for us and share why you think having a strong cop on the beat is essential to a fair marketplace? Thanks, Congressman. I mean, I've been very clear that my worry has been about under enforcement. Uh, unfortunately, I think there were missed opportunities in the last few decades where uh, all too often entire sectors were allowed to consolidate. That has now created markets that are closed off to competition. Uh, recently, the Defense Department has been noting how this consolidation is also now directly undermining national security, uh, where significant consolidation in the defense industrial base is harming our military and making it more difficult for us to compete globally. Uh, these are just some of the harms that we've seen from consolidation. Because of that, we think it's incredibly important to be vigorously enforcing the laws that Congress has charged us with enforcing. This includes the FTC's pro Act Prohibition on Unfair Methods of Competition. It includes the Clayton Act. It includes the Sherman Act. Uh, there have been provisions of these statutes that unfortunately had been left dormant, and we are fully committed to reinvigorating the law and make sure that we are fully enforcing all of the provisions that Congress has charged us with enforcing. I know that you, I, I assume you also enforce the uh, um, Salakifover Act. Um, I know that you also support bringing court actions instead of reaching a settlement under a consent decree with a company that has broken the law. Why is this? So, Congressman, we assess every matter on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, on the antitrust side, we have seen, unfortunately, instances in which certain remedies that were achieved in merger settlements, unfortunately, fail to fully protect competition in the ways that the agencies are required to do under the law. So certain behavioral commitments that firms made or certain divestitures really fail to preserve the competition that we're charged with Man with safeguarding. Uh, as a result, we're learning from that experience and adjusting and modifying where needed. Uh, in some cases, that means bringing a lawsuit. If a remedy that's being offered, we don't believe, will fully resolve the underlying competitive harms. Uh, in other instances, it means really improving and strengthening and tightening up uh, the remedies that we are achieving. So it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Despite claims from the majority that you did not follow ethics guidance, we know for a fact that under the law you have no conflicts of interest that would require you to accuse yourself, correct? Correct. And indeed, the designated ethics official instructed you correctly that the decision to accuse yourself was a personal one that you are charged to make, correct? That's right. And you also spoke with the general counsel's office who also stated that you do not have a conflict of interest that would require your recusal, correct? That's right, correct. And you do not own any stock in any corporation or have any personal ties that would require you to, ex to recuse yourself, correct? I have not a penny in any individual firm stock, correct? The Federal Trade Commission plays a critical role in protecting consumers, ensuring competition, and enforcing the laws we have entrusted to it. The agency has done this work for over 100 years, and I appreciate that it will continue to do so under your leadership. And finally, Mr. Chairman, before I yield back, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a copy of the letter uh, from, the, uh, from uh, Lena Khan to the Honorable Kathy McMorris Rogers and yourself. Wow. Letter, it's already, I already have your one in. I appreciate it. That's fine. Without objection, that, that uh, so ordered. Thank you. I yield back. The, 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 the gentleman from uh, uh, California, Mr. Kiley, is recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Ms. Khan. Uh, a few days ago, you lost another case. Uh, this was your challenge to the Activision acquisition. The Northern District of California, in an opinion by a Biden appointee, denied your request for a preliminary injunction. After what the court called a voluminous pre- and post-hearing written submissions, the court found you were not likely to succeed on the merits. You seem to be losing quite a bit, and I, I don't say that to be disrespectful, but these are, after all, taxpayer funds. You're now 0 for 4 in merger trials, the average win rate for the FTC in the modern antitrust era is around 75%. So I have to ask, why are you losing so much? Thanks for the question, Congressman. Uh, I should note, first of all, that the FTC 
has some of the best litigators around. And in the very trial that you mentioned, it was just phenomenal to see, and the judge herself personally commented on how the fact that the FTC, despite being totally out-resourced by some of these companies, was really able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in terms of legal talent and skill. Uh, and I'm enormously proud of our litigation. Well, I'm not sure the taxpayers are going to take much, uh, you know, delight in the legal talent and skill uh, of enforcement actions that cost great taxpayer dollars and end in defeat. So the question is, why is your track record so poor when it comes to actually winning cases? Uh, Congressman, we've had significant success in the courts. Uh, there are a whole set of matters, including uh, our case uh, against Martin Shkreli, where the court found resoundingly in the FTC's favor, uh, also uh, banned Martin Shkreli for life from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we also had- Okay, so you're, but you're 0 for 4 in, in merger trials. And so when I was trying to figure out What's going on here? I, I found maybe a clue uh, in an article from the New York Times, December 7th, 2022, which reported comments you made at a conference where you said this. You said, if there's a law violation and agencies think that current law might make it difficult to reach, there's a huge benefit to still trying. She added that any courtroom losses would signal to Congress that lawmakers need to update, update antitrust laws to better suit the modern economy. I'm certainly not somebody who thinks that success is marked by a 100% uh, court record. You said. So this raises the question, Chair Khan, are you losing on purpose? Congressman, the key clause in the quote mm -hmm. you mentioned was if there is a law violation. We only bring cases when the facts before us lead us to believe that there is a law violation under the existing laws. Uh, on the merger front, there are a whole set of cases where we've won. Uh, including in instances where the parties abandoned and walked away after okay, the Okay, you're 0 for 4 in murder trials. Complaint. So what did you mean when you said that any courtroom losses would signal to Congress that lawmakers need to update the antitrust laws? What does, what does that mean? So there is an institutional dialogue, right, between enforcers, between Congress, between the courts. Uh, you know, there's a century worth of antitrust back and forth between the agencies, between Congress. This very committee in the 1950s determined that the agencies were not bringing the types of cases that Congress was worried about in terms of monopoly power. Congress okay, but you're actually bringing the cases, you're losing because you don't have the authority that you want from Congress. So this is how you think you're gonna persuade Congress to give you more authority, is by exceeding the authority that you now have? Congressman, again, we only bring lawsuits where we believe there is a law violation given the facts and the law at hand. Uh, you know, we, we fight hard when we believe that there is a law violation, and unfortunately things don't always go our way, but uh, we, you know, make determinations. But, but about are you bringing cases appeal. that you expect to lose? Could you repeat Are that? you bringing cases that you expect to lose? Absolutely not. Okay, well, your track record seems to suggest otherwise. Let's look more closely at the Activision decision, though. Uh, the court first noted that in an attempt to lower your burden, you essentially made up case law. You couldn't find anything, uh, actually, that the courts have provided in terms of precedent, so you cited to your own FTC decision uh, as precedent. But irrespective of the legal standard, uh, the court, you probably wouldn't have won under any standard because the court said this, that the FTC has not raised serious questions regarding whether the pro proposed merger is likely to substantially lessen competition. Not raised serious questions. The court also rejected your, not only rejected your assertion of a likely anti-competitive effect, but found just the opposite, that the record evidence points to more consumer access. So why should Americans have faith in your judgment when this Biden-appointed judge says you are so far off the mark? Congressman, this matter is still pending before the FTC in administrative adjudication, so I'm just going to be limited in what I can say about the merits. Uh, our complaint lays out uh, the staff's view of the, what this merger would result in and why that would be a law violation. Uh, you may but the judge that. roundly rejected it and said there weren't even serious questions, and now having lost, you're spending even more taxpayer money on an appeal that you're even less likely to win because the appeals court is going to defer to the trial court's findings of fact in this very fact-intensive matter. So why are you spending even more taxpayer resources pursuing this appeal? So I can say again, this was a you know, staff recommendation. I can say it a general matter. Uh, staff always looks closely at an opinion and looks at whether there are certain errors in law that they believe are worth appealing on. Those are in general the types of determinations that go into whether the FTC ends up appealing. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Kahn, I thank you for being here and for putting up with some of the questions you have been asked. 
Yesterday, FBI Director Ray sat here for almost five hours and put up with continual questions attacking his patriotism, his judgment. Uh, it was really amazing, the hypocrisy that was shown. The issue was weaponization of the FBI. And yet, every member of this panel who was here on January 6, 2021, knows that the government was weaponized on that day, as I said, nuclearized, to take over the government, to overthrow the government, in contradiction of the oath of office that each of us had taken, and that we've learned that certain members of this committee went and met with Donald Trump, and that they were participating in the overthrow of our government, the nuclearization slash weaponization of our government, and yet they had the chutzpah, the audacity, the lack of integrity to question Ray's judgment, and went on and on. And I was sorry, I came in here today, and I'm Is sorry. the gentleman accusing us of a lack of integrity? Mr. Chairman, if you would ask whoever it is to shut up. I I'm was sure the chairman will rule when, when he comes back. I came back. in today, and I heard some questions about your relationship with the Bar Association. Hey, you don't talk about rope in a house where a man's been hung. You don't ask about membership in the Bar Association on a Judiciary Committee where there are members who never pass the bar and aren't members of the bar. And they are members of this committee in good standing. So we need to get beyond the hypocrisy and realize where we are and don't raise such subjects. Chairman Kahn, let me ask you this. The Federal Trade Commission deals in issues that protect consumers. And subscriptions to magazines, to services on the subscription services for media are everywhere, and you can subscribe to them easily. But it's hard to unsubscribe. It's difficult to find that spot. Uh, this has been a problem to consumers, and the companies just make money hand over fist as people give up on trying to unsubscribe or cancel their membership. What steps is the FTC taking to reel in these predatory practices? So, Congressman, you're absolutely right. Um, we have a complaint database where we hear directly from consumers. Oftentimes, we hear about significant frustrations about these subscriptions that are very easy to sign up for, but expectively impossible in some cases to fully cancel. Uh, we've brought enforcement actions, including a case we brought against Vonage last year. We also recently proposed a rule. It's our click to cancel rule that requ required that companies make it as easy to cancel a subscription as it is to sign up for one. We've been collecting public comments. We're going to look closely at the record and determine how to proceed. Thank you for that. I tried to, I had a bundle with Disney, Hulu, and ESPN 26 or something. And uh, I tried to get out of that bundle and just do Hulu or something. And whatever it is, I'm being charged for both of them. And I've given up. I've just tried to cancel, and it's just too much. It needs to be easy. That's right. And we've also seen through our work that companies sometimes use what are known as dark patterns. These are these manipulative design techniques that are designed to trick people into either, you know, signing up for unwanted services or that make it very difficult to cancel or opt out of something. And so those manipulative design tactics are very much on our radar. Another consumer anti-consumer practice is robocalls, and I've heard about it forever. And it bothers me, it bothers so many people to get these robocalls and asking you to sign up for this or sign up for that and to speak and they get you. Uh, this is also, I think, the FCC maybe, but what is the FTC doing to help us with these deceptive calls? So we, we work hard on this front. Uh, one thing that we've been thinking about is how can we be most effective and efficient with our resources? Uh, we've been looking upstream at the voice over internet protocol providers who sometimes are helping facilitate or enable these robocalls, and so we've brought a whole set of enforcement actions against them uh, in order to have a more deterrent impact and really protect consumers from these unwanted calls. And if you try to encourage or help companies that the public where antitrust actions could give them more op choices and, and, and better prices. Absolutely. Well, I thank you for what you're doing. Uh, by the way, do you have any, any, any books that you checked out from the library that are overdue? No. Um, I, the public really cares about that. That's important. <laughs> I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, 
On behalf of the committee uh, for the work that your 1,600 plus full-time equivalents do on areas like thwarting robocalls and your efforts to uh, promote the right to repair, I want to thank the people at the FTC. Our beef, though, is not with much of the good work you do, uh, much of which, as you said to Mr. Kiley, is successful in uh, uh, when you litigate. Uh, our problem here today, my problem here today, is that you're a bully. You have half a billion dollars to spend, and you choose to spend it promoting a policy that when you were a staffer sitting behind us, you seem to be very much into it. I believe you've taken the idea that companies should have to be less competitive in order to merge, that every merger has to be somehow bad for the company and good for the consumer, a standard that cannot be met. I will take, for example, example, Illumina, a situation in which they have had the audacity to tell you that a company that they spun off but still held major assets in, that asked to be reacquired so that a breakthrough, non-competitive drug, a, a technology of, of, of uh, detection of cancer could be promoted more quickly one which has no current competitor, one which is not on the market, and yet you decided that a company with a market cap of about 10%, that of Pfizer, somehow would be anti-competitive if it assimilated a new, uh, uh, took on something that would be new, that it had helped internally produce before spinning it off. You're failing in that, you're going to fail. You then took on Microsoft, Microsoft's a big, big company. Everybody up here seems to want to beat on anyone that has over a trillion dollar market cap. And when you served on the committee, you were big on, if you were over a trillion dollars, we need to break you up or stop you. However, that merger that you lost the other day is one in which a protected market that Sony enjoys in, China, in Japan, a company that is already larger, needs competition. The reality is, we are a global market, and you are thinking only of who you want to go after for some reason. And I cannot find your logic, and I believe that it begins at the top. I do, when you blamed your staff and said staff decisions, shame on you. The fact is, you run this organization, and its left turn came when you took over, not with the staff that many of whom would have already been there. Now, one of the things that, that beyond Illumina that, that, that gets me is, and this is my question to you, if cancer patients die because you had blocked the merger, which you didn't because they went forward over your objections and will continue to fight you, if cancer patients die because they don't have the money to bring this technology forward, who, where is the consumer benefited? And I know that you're going to say, Illumina is currently pending. We're still working on it. I can't answer. It's interesting. You can answer yes or no to the Democrats, but you can never answer simply to us. But I'll give you a chance. If something is not on the market and an organization of two companies say we want to merge to bring something to the market, where does the FTC see anti-competitiveness? Briefly, if you can answer. So before I answer, I should just note, if anybody asks me on either side about an ongoing No, no, matter, please answer my question. To, my time will, is limited. I will not be able to answer about ongoing adjudicative okay. proceedings. Relating to the matter that you mentioned, um, I was not at the commission when it was voted out. Uh, there was a recent commission opinion. In that opinion, uh, we lay out our view. That was voted out um, unanimously. We laid out our view about how the antitrust laws apply in nascent markets. There is significant case law around how it's incredibly important to be protecting competition, not just in well-established markets, but especially okay. in nascent so markets. So let's, let's go back through this. Your opinion, the opinion whether you inherited it or not that you seem to bear, is that in the future there could be a failure to have competition in a market that has not yet occurred. If people have to meet a standard of your hypothetical market will not develop because we we, we have to predict the future. If your ability to predict the future is so good, how is it you could not predict that you were going to lose four out of four cases? How is it you can predict the future of markets when, in fact, the stock market can't even do it? I would contend 
that you have overstepped your boundaries and your half billion dollar uh, budget is being wasted. And I, for one, will not support your $160 million increase as long as you do not stick to those things which you do well, which the FTC has a responsibility, and for those robocalls that, in fact, you have never managed to stop. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The, uh, the gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to commend my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in the 118th Congress in diversifying the membership on their side of the aisle. Uh, but frankly, we haven't done enough. Um, they have not done enough. They can't do enough at this point. And it reflects in the treatment that a witness such as yourself, uh, Chair Khan, receives from this committee. Uh, when a witness comes in uh, sitting solo at that table in front of all of these uh, interrogators, um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, a, it's a daunting look. The American people can see it. And, um, and when we treat a witness who looks like you uh, with the politics of personal destruction, and when we only attack witnesses who look like you uh, with allegations of incompetence and, um, and a lack of ability to lead their agency. It's indicative of the need for this committee uh, to reflect uh, what the American people look like. And I want to appreciate you today for withstanding uh, what you have had to endure thus far. And we've only begun. Uh, but I will say this, uh, 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 Chair Khan, Americans rely on regulations to protect consumers and workers in this country, and the Federal Trade Commission should be as aggressive in its enforcement as the circumstances dictate. Today in America, there are only four large corporate conglomerates that control the market for beef, pork, pork and poultry. Consolidation in the meatpacking industry shows up at the grocery store resulting in inflation for consumers and, at the same time, coincidentally, uh, record high profits for the uh, corporate conglomerates who are soaking uh, those profits from the American people. A single company controls most of the web searching, and a single company controls nearly half of all e-commerce. That's too much power in the hands of too few corp corporations. And they can hike prices with little recourse. They control vast amounts of personal data. And consumers are being squeezed by consolidation in almost every aspect of the marketplace, from food production to hospitals. So I'm glad to see that uh, you are using your position to strongly enforce antitrust laws to ensure fair competition and prices. Moreover, we're lucky to have an, an FTC chair who does not have personal or monetary conflicts of interest that would require her to recuse herself from cases involving big tech companies. That is a good thing. Because of that, Chair Khan is able to lead an agency that is properly investigating companies like Amazon, Meta, Facebook, and Twitter. And I'm glad that we do not have the fox guarding the hen house, that we, and that we instead have an FTC that is actively working to protect American consumers. Now, um, I want to ask you, uh, Chair Khan, pharmacy benefit managers manage prescription drug benefits on behalf of large insurers, large employers, and other, play other payers. However, this middleman role allows PBMs to artificially inflate the prices of drugs that individuals must pay for critical medications, resulting in consumers having to pay almost 20% more for generic drugs. And the market for PBMs is an area of the market that is highly consolidated with just three PBMs controlling 79% of the market. What can the commission do to ensure the market for pharmacy benefit managers is competitive and fair so that Americans can afford their prescription drugs? 
This is an area where we're looking very closely. Uh, we issued a policy statement last year unanimously noting some of our concerns in the pharmacy benefit management space. In addition to the consolidation that you mentioned, we've also seen vertical integration. So these PBMs have also now expanded into insurance. Uh, sometimes they're competing with the very pharmacies that are dependent on them. We've heard that that can create conflicts of interest. We've also heard that these PBMs demand rebates in ways that may be denying patients access to more affordable drugs. So we've put the market on notice that we are looking at these practice cl practices closely. If we find law violations, we won't hesitate to act. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have Mr. a unanimous. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a point of order. I have a unanimous consent request. You do the point of order, then I'll come to your your unanimous consent. Mr. Chairman, I, I waited for the gentleman to complete his uh, his time, but I must raise a point of order that I personally felt that he was referring to all Republicans, but particularly to me, for his comments about diversity and his comments about our treating the witness. Uh, apparently because of her, the color of her skin, which happens to be similar to my brown skin. Uh, and I would ask that that portion of his testimony be taken down as inappropriate and uh, argumentative to and making a racial slur against myself and other members of the Congress, who, by the way, yesterday treated what I would call a very white man of a greater age Is this a very point of order, Mr. Chairman, no, or is this a speech? I don't... I, I, don't, I don't think the gentleman's point of order has been stated in a timely fashion. It's supposed to happen right after the statement. Then I withdraw my point of order, but oh, not I, my I, objection. I, well, I would just point out we should all, we should all proper, uh, engage in proper decorum, not disparage colleagues, not disparage people in the government, um, uh, not disparage anyone. So let's just keep and, that in mind. And with that, I, I know we got a unanimous consent. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would move. Uh, for the entry of a letter from Small Business Rising uh, to yourself as well as to the uh, ranking member, uh, Gerald Nadler, uh, into the uh, record without objection. Without objection. And uh, I'd also like to take, if, if the uh, chair will allow me to, uh, the opportunity to simply clarify to my friend, uh, Briefly. Chair Issa, that uh, no personal uh, um, affront uh, was intended. Uh, this was directed at the entire uh, panel. We got that. We got that. The chairman recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin. <laughs> that makes me feel good, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Um, Chair Khan, thank you for being here today. Last December, I sent you a letter along with several of my colleagues asking about the FTC's consideration of environmental, social, and corporate governance factors, or ESG as it's known in merger enforcement. I appreciate that you had a prompt response in answering that FTC would not support conditioning the approval of the unlawful merger on the adoption of a particular set of ESG policies or commitments. Uh, while pleased with the first part of the response, uh, you did not answer whether you would block a merger if it met traditional comp competition criteria but falls short of some standard on uh, ESG goals. Can you commit that ESG criteria will not play a role in a decision by the FTC to block a merger? Microphone, please. Apologies. We look at the text of the statutes, which tell us to block mergers if they substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. That's what we look at. Again, if companies make certain commitments to us about social justice commitments or ESG commitments, those are irrelevant to us. Okay, thank you. Since becoming chair, have you ever communicated using Signal, WhatsApp, or through a different encrypted messaging app on matters principally related to antitrust or consumer protection policy, FTC enforcement actions, press, political strategy, or any official communication? In particular, uh, I'm interested to see if you've had any communication with Senator Warren, state's attorneys general, or outside groups. Congressman, the FTC has a very clear policy requiring that any FTC business relating to substantial matters be conducted only on authorized FTC devices, and I fully comply with that policy. Did you have any communication with your now senior advisor, Ms. Sarah Miller? Sarah Miller works for you, is that right? Ms. Miller joined my staff earlier this year, correct. Uh, while she was in her role at the Economic Liberties Project, uh, regarding the decision to air attack ads on members of this committee, including myself, for our opposition to the FTC's proposed non-compete rule. Uh, 
the congressman. I talked to a lot of people, but I'm never involved in those types of discussions. So you weren't involved in, in the uh, idea to, in fact, go after members of this committee uh, congressman, in their districts? Uh, Congressman, we're really excited about this proposal. We're accepting a lot of public comments. We're eager to hear from members of com Congress. I've talked to many of you about the proposal. Uh, we're eager to hear your, your feedback and input. It was announced last night that you intended to break 30 years of precedent by challenging the court's ruling in the merger of Microsoft and Activision. Can you explain why, despite 39 countries and the European Union already clearing this merger that you intend to move forward with, and admin, on administrative proceedings. So, Congressman, again, this matter is pending before the Commission in our administrative adjudication, so I can't comment on the merits. When we get an adverse ruling, our teams look closely at the text of the opinion, determine whether there are errors of law that they believe warrant an appeal. Those are the types of considerations that they take into account. In April of this year, the FTC's Associate Director for Litigation for the Bureau of Competition stated at a conference that, quote, merger policy is industrial policy. And, quote, there is a role for merger policy in directing the way capital flows into projects. That means at the next venture capital meeting, they're not going to say, what's the exit via acquisition? It will be, how do we get to an IPO? Do you endorse this statement? Congressman, I'm not familiar with the details of it. Happy to look at it in a question for the record. I'll say generally, it is true that antitrust and competition policy is about ensuring robust competition. Entrepreneurs benefit from that. Startups benefit from that. I just met with some venture capitalists the other week that were expressing concern about a lack of exit options that don't involve being bought up by one of the large technology companies. So these are certainly issues that we hear about. I think... Um, the issue for myself and many of my colleagues has been that the way you're running the FTC, that you're not simply trying to kill deals in the boardroom. You're also killing small businesses still in the crib. You want startups to seek an IPO rather than an acquisition, but the cost of entering the public markets has doubled since the 90s, and your colleague, Mr. Gensler, at the SEC has been piling on with the rulemaking. So I don't know if uh, this is what the administration means by Biden economics, uh, but I have to ask, why would anyone start a small business under this administration right now? So, Congressman, we hear regularly from small businesses. Uh, one of the things that we started since I joined the commission is open commission meetings where anybody in the country can sign up and come talk to us. We hear from a lot of small businesses. More often than not, what we hear is about the challenges that they face in being able to compete in an open, competitive marketplace. We hear about how the existing giants and existing incumbents are squeezing them and making it difficult, be it for an independent grocer, an independent pharmacist. So we are very eager to hear from small businesses and make sure we're enforcing the laws in the ways that are enabling everybody to compete in the marketplace. Chairman, I yield back. Time the gentleman's expired. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to our, our witness for being here. I have an interest in several areas where it seems to me the FTC has been less than robust, and which maybe you can disabuse me of that notion. First, in the area of uh, swipe fees, Visa and MasterCard have more than 83% of market share. Uh, this is, uh, you know, Congress and Gooden and I introduced the Credit Card Competition Act of 2023 to introduce competition. We are small businesses, pay a higher swipe fee than uh, people do in other developed nations, and I'm wondering uh, whether the FTC uh, will be having an active engagement in this area. I'm also concerned about uh, the issue of consolidation in the grocery sector. Um, these uh, large uh, companies have the power to secure preferential pricing and treatment from suppliers to the detriment of independent grocers. Now, recently, Mr. Tiffany and I led an appropriations request for $10 million specifically for FTC enforcement of the Robinson-Patman Act. I'm interested in what you can tell us about uh, FTC and Robinson-Patman. I also uh, have long been a champion of right to repair Congressman Ice and I recently introduced a legislation uh, to limit the enforcement period of design patents uh, so that 
uh, monopolies cannot prevent individuals uh, from repairing uh, their own art, um, their own, uh, what they own. Uh, the nixing the fix report was before your tenure, but I'm interested in what FTC is interested in doing in this area going forward. And finally, Congresswoman Eshoo and I introduced what I think is the toughest online privacy act that's ever been introduced in Congress. It simply prevents companies uh, from collecting data so they cannot then use it to manipulate Americans. I'm interested in what actions the FTC is going to take to minimize uh, data minim uh, minimization, which I think is a key to data security, privacy, and also uh, uh, helpful in competition. So on your first point, uh, just a few months ago, the FTC uh, announced an enforcement action against MasterCard. Uh, we alleged that there was a violation of the Durbin Amendment and that MasterCard had engaged in unlawful tactics to block competing networks and really stifle the competition that Congress has sought to encourage in this market back in 2010, because I think you're absolutely right. We still see uh, fees that are much higher than what we see in sectors where you have more competition. Uh, Robinson Patman and reinvigorating enforcement of it is a top priority. Uh, we've certainly heard from independent grocers about the ways in which uh, differential treatment and discriminatory prices uh, may be squeezing them and disfavoring them, uh, making it difficult to compete, especially in parts of rural America. Uh, that's something that we're looking at closely. We also, um, uh, several months ago, launched a uh, market inquiry looking at supply chain disruptions and the degree to which that type of differential treatment may have contributed. Uh, on right to repair, uh, this has been a big area of focus for us. Uh, in addition to the great staff report you mentioned, we also issued a policy statement. We followed up with several enforcement actions, including one against Harley-Davidson, one against Weber. Um, since then, we've also been working with state legislatures, several of whom are also considering right to repair legislation. Uh, just the other month, one of our staffers went to California to testify before the state Senate there uh, to give input and feedback on their legislative efforts in this area. So we're bringing our own lawsuits, but also looking to serve as force multipliers where other legislators are looking to be active. Uh, ensuring robust privacy protections for Americans is a top priority. We've been extraordinarily active in this area, especially when it involves children's privacy. Uh, we brought a, a enforcement action against Epic Games because we found that certain lax privacy policies that they had in place were as endangering children. We've also been looking at people's sensitive health information and instances in which companies are collecting health data uh, for the purpose ostensibly of providing health services, but then are turning it around and making it available for advertising. Uh, and we're also looking at geolocation data. Uh, we have a lawsuit pending in, in Idaho against a data broker called Cochava, uh, where we allege in our complaint that its practices uh, allowed people to, allowed companies to track and get very sensitive geolocation information on consumers in ways that revealed whether they were going to church, whether they were seeking certain types of health services, uh, whether they were seeking addiction recovery facilities, very sensitive data. So that lawsuit is still pending. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. I yield back. General Lee yields back. Chair recognizes himself. Madam Chair, why, um, why are you harassing Twitter? Uh, Congressman, thanks for the question. As you might know, the FTC's work on Twitter goes back a decade. Back in 2000. I'm not talking about a decade. I'm talking about now. Back 12 in demand letters in 10 weeks, 300, over 350 separate requests you've demanded of Twitter. Why are you harassing them? Twitter has a history of lax security and privacy policies. Previously you've asked for every single communication relating to Elon Musk, not communications that he just sent to someone or some or communications he received, but any time he's mentioned. That, that actually seems more, actually more than harassment. That seems like almost an obsession. Why, why, the, why, why such an intense focus? So, Congressman, again, it was found that Twitter's lax privacy policies allowed unauthorized users to co-opt Twitter accounts, including that of Fox News. Subsequently, Twitter voluntarily entered into a consent order with the FTC. Here's, here's Unfortunately, what you wrote in December, Madam Chair. Here's what you wrote in December. 
identify all journalists and other members of the media to whom Twitter has granted access since Musk bought the company. You want to know the name of every journalist a private company has talked to? Think that's consistent with the First Amendment? Congressman, as a former journalist, I take extremely seriously the valuable work that they do and understand that there can be instances in which government action is unjustified. Particularly, particularly, Madam Chair, if I could, if I could just interject, particularly in the context here. I mean, it's bad enough if you got government asking a private company about who are the journalists you're talking to. You name four of them and say we want the other names of any journalists you may, in fact, be communicating with. That's bad enough, and I think a threat to the First Amendment freedom of the press. But in the context of giving us information about how government had suppressed speech on these platforms, that's the context you're asking for. I think that's particularly troubling, don't you? Congressman, the consent decree that we have prohibits Twitter from sharing personal information with third parties. When we read in the papers, like everybody else, that Twitter may have granted access to third parties, that's what our teams were seeking information about. Again, this is a company whose history with the FTC Madam, goes Madam back Chair, a decade. Madam Chair, we got limited time. Madam, Madam Chair, who is uh, David Roque? Could you repeat that, Congressman? David Roque, R-O-Q-U-E. Who is David Roque? I'm not familiar with You that. deposed him last month, June 21st, 2023. David Roque is the independent partner for Ernst & Young's independent assessment of Twitter's program. That's part of this consent decree. Um, do you know what Mr. Roque said in that deposition? I'm not aware. Okay, let me read it for you then, because I think it's pretty important. Mr. Roque testified, again, in front of your lawyers, you deposed him, testified that FTC's conduct made him feel as if the FTC was trying to influence the outcome of the engagement before it had started. He said, in some of the discussions that we were having with the Federal Trade Commission, expectations were being conveyed about what those results should be before we had even begun any procedures. So they're the independent assessor in this consent decree the FTC has with Twitter, and you're telling the guy, who is the, the person? He's the guy. He's Joe, the accountant, who's going to get this information. You're telling him, you're putting your finger on the scale, telling him what you want the outcome to be, and he's supposed to be the independent fact finder. Why are you doing that? Congressman, I'm not familiar with those. Because it was just filed today, but we are. This is filed in court today, and this is your deposition. I'm happy to take a closer look at it and be back in touch. I will say as a general matter, we want to make sure that the assessors and auditors that are responsible for overseeing compliance are doing their job. You're saying Mr. Roke's line, what he testified here, what's been filed in court today, that there were suggestions of what they would expect the outcome to be, they being the FTC, there were suggestions of what they wanted him to go find in his independent assessment of the consent degree agreement, uh, 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 agreement between the FTC and Twitter. Again, I'm happy to take a close look and we can be back in touch with you about that allegation, but our staff are consummate professionals. Uh, when they conduct these investigations, they're focused on determining did you go after, whether there did was you a go after, did you? Is your uh, uh, attack on Twitter, harassment on Twitter, is that based on, on the fact that all kinds of Democrats have asked you to do this and, frankly, some things that you've written about dealing with, quote, disinformation? Does that have anything to do with it, Ms. Khan? Congressman, we make only independent determinations about whether there were law violations. Um, the statement from Chairman Nadler, the statements from uh, the, the letter, the press release in the letter from seven Democrat senators that had no impact on it, that's not why you're doing it? Absolutely not. We look very closely at the specific matter at hand. Again, 12 Twitter demand letters in 10 weeks telling the independent assessor, hey, put your finger on the scale, this is the results we want. That's, that's, that's not harassment and it had nothing to do with the fact that every Democrat in this town seemed to be telling you to go after Twitter. Our focus is on protecting people's privacy and security. Uh, Twitter has sensitive data on 150 million Americans, including private messages. We need to make sure, especially given its history going all the way back to 2010, we're doing everything to make sure Twitter is complying with the order. That's fine. Don't put your finger on the scale and don't attack the First Amendment and the rights of journalists. Mr. Chair, with that, I, point I, of order. I, yield, I yield back and recognize the gentleman from California for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you for your testimony today, and thank you for the refreshing and aggressive uh, approach you're taking to ensure uh, competition. Uh, in my view, we have reached a dangerous point in this country where there has been a tremendous concentration of corporate power uh, at the expense of, of working families. Uh, the challenge we face today is not that people aren't working. People are working. Uh, the problem is they're not making enough to get by, uh, and part of that is the result 
of this concentration of power in corporate hands, uh, the likes of which I don't think we have seen in our history. So I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, I, I want to uh, ask you in particular about an issue I've written to you about uh, that concerns me, and that is consolidation uh, among the large grocery stores, the large grocery chains. Um, this has the potential of not only having an adverse impact on price, but also having an adverse impact in the form of job losses, in the form of creation of food deserts impacting communities. Uh, and uh, I would, if you're able to share your thoughts in terms of that particular merger, great. If you're not, uh, I would ask uh, more generally uh, what you're looking at in terms of impacts uh, and also vis-a-vis -vis the narrowness of the, uh, the, the doctrine that focuses only on consumer prices. Um, would that prevent you from looking at other criteria such as the impact on communities and the impact on workers? So we seek to take a 360 view to make sure we're fully understanding how a particular merger may be lessening competition in ways that are harming uh, consumers, but that may be high hurting suppliers. In the context of grocery mergers, we really are, take care to make sure we're looking at all sides. Um, as you noted, there is a pending investigation that um, Kroger Albertson have disclosed. The FTC is looking at their proposal. Um, I think you're absolutely right, though we've seen the consolidation in the grocery sector can have devastating effects for communities uh, contributing to food deserts. One practice that is also on our radar is the way in which grocery chains can be using what are known as restrictive covenants to try to lock out competition geographically, uh, which may also be contributing to these food deserts. So we're looking at that closely, and we want to make sure that we're enforcing the antitrust laws in ways that are serving all communities. Well, I, I appreciate that. I have grave concerns about the Kroger-Albertson's merger uh, and the impact on the communities that I represent and many others throughout California and the country uh, in terms of impact on workers, on prices, uh, and on communities. Um, let me just uh, turn to the issue um, that the chairman was just raising with you. Uh, you didn't get much of a chance to elaborate on the privacy and security problems at Twitter uh, and how they could impact the privacy of millions and millions of Americans. Um, I'd like to give you that opportunity because I'm uh, both concerned with the enormous proliferation of hate speech on Twitter uh, the firing of many of the um, uh, individuals charged with security at Twitter uh, and what impact that has on the rise of hate, but also on the uh, decrease in uh, security and privacy of people's data at Twitter. So again, we're squarely focused on the privacy and security implications of any decisions that may be made. Um, as I noted, Twitter's history with the FTC goes back over a decade where Serious security and privacy lapses led to personal information being compromised. As you noted, Twitter today also has access to deeply personal sensitive information. Uh, in 2022, we entered into a revised consent order because we found that Twitter, unfortunately, had been in violation of the prior consent order. Whenever we have repeat offenders at the agency, we're always thinking very hard about what we can be doing to prevent repeat violations. Uh, our revised order has even tighter privacy and security provisions. Uh, it was voted out unanimously at the commission, uh, and we'll continue to make sure that our orders are being followed and that companies are protecting people's privacy and security. Well, I appreciate that, and, and I'd also like to ask unanimous consent to enter in the record a couple articles, uh, one from uh, Gizmodo, Elon Musk, king of censorship, 10 times the free speech abolitionist silenced Twitter users, uh, and also an article um, from the rest of the world, Twitter's complying with more government demands under Elon Musk, uh, find it. which includes Twitter's self-reported data shows that under Musk, the company has complied with hundreds more government orders for censorship or surveillance, especially in countries such as Turkey uh, and India. I request consent to enter the record. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from uh, Colorado is recognized. I thank the Chairman. Uh, Chair Khan, thank you for uh, being here. Do you own stock in Apple, Amazon, Facebook, or Google? No. Do you own stock in any of the competitors to those companies? I do not. Do you know that the uh, ethics official who requested that you recuse yourself from any activities involving Facebook owned stock in Facebook? Um, I, I learned about that, yes. Do you know how much it costs to buy Congress? 
Well, big tech does. They spent $250 million against the bills that passed out of this committee last Congress. Um, they spent money lobbying. They spent money on uh, advertising in members' districts. They spent money uh, with um, third-party think tanks. They spent money that uh, no other effort um, uh, in recent memory certainly uh, has been spent. And uh, it's not just the money that they spent, uh, but, but on lobbying, for example, Meta spent, and I call it uh, Facebook, $20 million, $70,000. Amazon, $19,320,000. Alphabet, $11,770,000. Apple, $6,500,000. Um, but it's not just the money that they spent on lobbying and those activities. On June 18th, 2021, just five days before the markup hearing of the big tech bills in this committee, Paul Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's tech investor husband, bought 4,000 shares of Alphabet via a call option in which he promised stocks at a later date at a price of $1,200 a share a month later. Now, this is after we've passed the bills, but Nancy Pelosi, the speaker, sent Steny Hoyer, the majority leader, to the press to tell the press that these bills were not ready for the floor. A month later the stock price rose to over $2,500, making Paul Pelosi $5.2 million richer without spending a penny. Speaker Pelosi's office, it should be noted, issued a statement denying any involvement or prior knowledge of the transaction. The fact that remains that she refused to bring to a vote on the House floor those bills. Bills that resulted from an 18-month-long investigation. We had, last year, as a result of uh, Congresswoman Jayapal's efforts and my efforts and some other efforts, a stock ban in the House, a ban that would prohibit members from buying individual stocks. You probably also don't know that more than 50 members of Congress bought stocks in pharmaceutical companies during the COVID crisis when Congress immunized a, a good term, I guess, to use uh, during the COVID crisis, immunized pharmaceutical companies uh, if there was any problems with the vaccines that they created. But we can't pass a stock ban, but we can call you into Congress and suggest that somehow you shouldn't be involved in activities involving some of these companies because you wrote a law review article. Do you have a child... Uh, I, I'm not, I don't want you to answer that question just yet because that's personal. But do you have a child who is lobbying for Amazon or Facebook? No, he's turning six. <laughs> he's turning six months this week, so no. Okay, they'd probably still hire him. Yeah, yeah. If they thought they could influence you, they would hire your child at six months old because, in fact, they've hired Senator Schumer's daughters to lobby for them, and the same bills that passed the House didn't pass, or didn't get a chance, I'm sorry, the same bills that passed the House Judiciary Committee passed the Senate Judiciary Committee and never saw the light of day on the Senate floor either. But that's just how the game goes. You're well aware of the need to update the antitrust laws concerning the new economy that we are facing and I'd just like you, if you could, briefly to explain what is the need? Why is it so difficult to apply antitrust laws written at the turn of the last century to the new economy? Thanks, Congressman. So there is antitrust doctrine on the books that has embedded within it certain economic assumptions about how certain markets work, about what types of incentives businesses face, that doctrine in some cases is 30 years, 40 years old, way before we had the advent of digital markets. These digital markets function differently, right? You have the self-reinforcing advantages of data, network externalities, companies face different incentives, they're engaged in different strategies, and sometimes there can just be a gap between how the doctrine is saying businesses are acting 
and what we see in reality. And so legislative updates can be needed to close that gap between what the theory says or what the doctrine says and what we're all living with in actual markets. And so that's in particular where legislative action can be absolutely critical. <clears throat> gentleman's time has expired. Uh, gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chairperson Khan, welcome today. Um, what is your job? I have the great honor of serving as chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And what do you do in that role? Well, um, help manage the agency, uh, oversee both our Bureau of Consumer Protections work. Protect well consumers? Protect consumers, protect fair Where do you get that authority? Congress charged us with that in the FTC Act and subsequent legislative amendments. Is that new? Excuse me? That authority new? That authority uh, stems back to 1914 and then subsequent amendments in the, in the following decades. We talked a little bit earlier about litigation fees, enforcement costs. Let me ask you, are you a profit center or are you an agency in charge of protecting consumers, enforcing the law, and going after individuals that may prey on our consumers, our taxpayers? We're a government agency that is using every dollar we have to protect the American people from illegal business practices. Thank you. Let's talk about Main Street, people who sent us here to Washington. Um, I get scam calls every day, robocalls. Seniors get robocalls every day. Veterans get robocalls every day. How are you working with the FCC to stop these calls from happening? So we in the FCC have overlapping jurisdiction, as you noted. Uh, one thing that we're doing, in addition to going after some of the robocallers themselves, is identifying what are some of the upstream factors that are allowing these calls to proliferate. Uh, sometimes these calls are originating from other countries in ways that can make, us, make it difficult for us to go directly after them. This is why we look at VoIP providers and other upstream Madam service Madam Chair, providers. a number of years ago I had a situation in my district. We had to get Interpol involved. Calls were originating from Mexico. Uh, one of the local telephone companies were providing the, the calling uh, information, and it was a huge, huge mess. International, very much a difficult challenge. What can we in Congress do to help you rein in these predatory calls? There are certain leg certainly legislative updates that we're happy to recommend uh, to in you and your team. Uh, I would say generally, um, given that the FCC also has authority over the telecom carriers themselves, directly taking action in, at that layer could also probably have a very big impact. You know, at the end of those scam calls, you have victims, people that get hurt really bad and struggle to get that money back. What is your agency doing to help consumers get their money back? We're bringing lawsuits where we can. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, we suffered a big setback in court where the court said that 13B of the FTC Act, which has been a core provision that we use to go into court and get back money for people who have been uh, scammed out of money, the court said we can no longer use that authority. That was a big setback. Uh, since then, we've been activating other legislative authorities to make sure we're trying to get money back where we can, but there's no doubt that billions of dollars evaporated after that court decision and people are losing out as a result. So do you need legislative help from Congress to do your job? protect consumers in this area of junk fees? Absolutely. Uh, legislation in particular enabling the FTC to go into court under Section 13B and, and get money back so that lawbreakers are not profiting from their lawbreaking, that would be essential. I think that's important. Lawbreakers need to know there's somebody there, a police officer waiting to make sure that they follow the law. And too many times my locals get ripped off. They call the local PD. They don't know what to do. They call the local state agency. They don't know what to do. And I hope that you and your agencies can continue to be effective in making sure that consumers on Main Street are protected. Our seniors especially, that sometimes are embarrassed to call me and tell me I just got ripped off. They don't have the energy or the wherewithal to defend themselves. These are the people we need to be protecting I asked you if you were a profit center. I know you're not. But nonetheless, I encourage you to continue to do a good job because my constituents, American taxpayers, are relying on your agency and doing a good job. 
Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, I yield. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, you implemented the use of omnibus resolutions in antitrust investigations. These resolutions, in effect, give the chair of the FTC sole control over FTC investigations. The chair could direct staff to investigate a transaction, sign all subpoenas without a commission vote, which was previously necessary in investigations of almost all mergers and business conduct. Former commissioners Phillips and Wilson, Wilson resigned over much of this uh, type of action from you, uh, said that this paragraph eliminated the only layer of commission oversight. Wouldn't you agree that the use of omnibus resolutions in this matter undermines the bipartisan nature of the commission model? And are you trying to turn the commission into your own personal empire? Congressman, omnibus resolutions have long been used at the FTC before I joined. It's fairly standard for there to be omnibus resolutions on the consumer protection side, again, long before I joined. Changes we made brought the consumer protection side in symmetry with the competition side in order to empower our staff to act nimbly. Okay, let's talk about that because the staff has been leaving in droves. A report by Bloomberg found that 71 senior attorneys left the agency in the two-year period between 2021 and 2022, the highest number of departures in the category for a comparable two-year period since 2000. Uh, Coincidentally, the Progressive Change Campaign happens to have a list of 400 recommended names for positions in the FTC and the Biden administration. Has anyone, including Adam Green of the Progressive Change Campaign, communicated with you to hire any of these individuals? No. Okay. And have you hired any of these individuals? No, I don't know what list you're talking about, okay. to be honest. Um, Let's move on to this committee and your responsiveness or lack thereof to this committee, following up on what the Chairman asked, um, in March, uh, your director of the Office of Congressional Relations testified before my subcommittee on responsiveness and accountability to oversight regarding your refusal to produce documents related to this committee's oversight of the FTC's harassment of Elon Musk following his acquisition of Twitter. It's well known that the FTC frequently seeks extensive information from the party parties that it investigates. When those parties fail to produce what's required for the FTC to conduct its investigation, the FTC seeks sanctions. In the FTC's response to this committee's inquiry, most of what it has provided is already publicly available or otherwise incomplete. I find it inconceivable that the FTC would tolerate such a production from parties under its investigation. So what should this committee do and take from the FTC's paltry production to date on this matter? Congressman, our team has been enormously responsive. We've been working day after day to accommodate this committee's requests. We've offered and provided numerous non-public briefings, including on the matter that you mentioned. Uh, it is true when we have an ongoing law enforcement investigation, there are additional considerations we have to take into account to make sure we're not compromising law enforcement or chilling any of the free speech of the third parties that communicate with us. Does that include communication through non-governmental uh, email accounts? Because in the limited materials that you provided, we can see that your staff communicated using Gmail accounts. Uh, in other instances, employees from other agencies were using the employee's email account attached to that separate agency. So you were talking about how you're committed to using government communications methods. I don't know if you're aware that your staff is not, but what steps have you taken to secure responsive material from sources outside the FTC? Congressman, whenever anybody on boards into the FTC, we provide extensive training to make sure everybody knows only to use authorized devices. If sometimes inadvertently there is a message that props up somewhere else, you're supposed to forward it to your FTC email, and I imagine that's why it was actually captured in those productions. Okay. You asked Congress for a historic budget increase of $160 million or 37 uh, percent, citing staffing shortages, which you're largely responsible for, and insufficient resources. Uh, did you announce a joint effort within the DOJ Antitrust Division uh, with the FTC to send staff to Europe to assist with implementation of their Digital Markets Act? Uh, Congressman, we have a really fantastic Office of International Affairs that I inherited. It was launched in 2007 during the Bush administration. As part of our international efforts, we're routinely sending detailees. Do you know how much detailees. that costs? Excuse me? How much does it cost to send staffers to Europe? I don't know off the top of my head, but we're happy to provide that information if it would be helpful to you. Okay, well, uh, due to the uh, rank partisanship that's, that's come up in your agency, the uh, the fact that you all are ignoring congressional requests for information and the wastefulness that we've seen, uh, I know that uh, the Appropriations Committee is, is marking up you know, your budget as we speak, and they are seeking a 25 percent reduction in funding for the FTC today. 
actually the, the Appropriations Committee is going to be passing that uh, government funding bill. So uh, actions have consequences, Madam Chair, and you're about to see what consequences your actions have had. I yield back. Chairman yields back. The uh, gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. I was told. I was, sorry, told. I, was, I was just told that too and <laughs> forgot. The gentlelady from uh, the other side of the country is recognized from the state of Washington. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair Khan, as head of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, I would just like to thank you for the FTC's investigations and enforcement actions that protect small businesses and hardworking Americans and promote competition. You have done what few before you have dared to do. Um, few before you have had the courage to take on big corporations who use their endless lobbying money to hurt Americans with more fees, less transparency, and higher costs. You're taking on big tech and the monopoly powers that allow them to use our data and snuff out small business competitors. That was something that yesterday I got a lot of bipartisan praise for in taking on Director Ray at the FBI around privacy. You're doing the same thing, and there should be more people like Representative Ken Buck talking about that on this committee, talking about the efforts that you are making to finally put teeth into protecting consumers, and I am grateful for to you. In fact, I think it's precisely because of your success, your courage, and your integrity that you are receiving all these baseless attacks on your character. So just for the record, here are the facts. It was FTC ethics official L'Oreal Pankey, who owned stocks in Meta, when she recommended that Chair Khan recuse herself from investigating Meta, Facebook's parent company. In contrast, Chairwoman Khan owns no stocks in big tech, not one penny, and a federal judge ruled that her stances do not constitute a conflict of interest. So I want to thank you to your integrity and your commitment to mission which is precisely why the president appointed you to head the FTC. Now, I want to spend my time talking about your accomplishments, uh, uh, the FTC's accomplishments under your leadership. One in five workers are affected by non-compete clauses, which essentially means that employers restrict or ban workers in their employment contracts from freely switching jobs, just for the average person who's out there listening. The FTC is currently working on banning these non-compete clauses. Can you explain in plain, plain language, why your agency proposed this rule to ban non-compete clauses? I'm happy to, Congresswoman. I would be remiss if I um, didn't know you mentioned our ethics officer. Uh, from working with her, I know our ethics officer to be a dedicated career professional who serves the agency <clears throat> with nothing but its best interests at heart. Um, I understand in that instance she sought guidance from the Office of Government Ethics and acted consistently with it. Um, on non-competes, so these are clauses that lock in workers and prohibit them from being able to seek uh, an alternative job with a competitor for a period of time and oftentimes uh, geography limits. Uh, we've seen from our work that these clauses suppress worker wages to the tune of $300 billion, uh, and they also make it difficult for startups and entrepreneurs and new businesses to enter and compete, and that's why we've proposed this rule. And what types of workers are going to benefit from the implementation of that rule? At the proposal stage, it would be everybody. Um, you know, we've heard from gardeners, journalists, uh, healthcare workers, fast food workers, engineers, scientists. I mean, these non-compete clauses have really proliferated across markets and across our economy in ways that are now hurting everybody. So let me turn to your work on junk fees. There are a few issues today that unite members of Congress more on the Hill, and I'm proud to say that junk fees attract the ire of both Democrats and Republicans because, as your agency notes, they are, quote, surprise charges that inflate costs while adding little, or, uh, little to no value. So tell us how widespread these junk fees are and give us some examples of what you're talking about and how they harm consumers. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure everybody can relate to this in their day-to-day -day lives. You know, these are mystery fees that show up, be it a resort fee charge on your hotel bill or uh, an unwanted or unnecessary charge that shows up somewhere else. Uh, one of the areas where we've heard most about these junk fees is in the auto context. 
uh, you know, buying a car is one of the most uh, significant financial investments that people make. And unfortunately, we've heard that all too often uh, consumers are saddled with charges for unnecessary or unwanted or redundant fees. Uh, we're moving forward there. Uh, we also brought a lawsuit last year against Vonage for also including some of these junk fees when people tried to cancel their subscriptions. So that's just some of the work. We currently uh, sought comment on whether we should do more work on junk fees, including through potentially proposing a rule. We're reviewing those comments and determining how to move forward. And the FTC's got a long history of dealing with junk fees. Is that correct? That's right. Can you talk about that? So again, in the auto context in particular, I mean, we've gotten hundreds of thousands of complaints about this. We've brought dozens of lawsuits um, addressing junk fees that consumers are saddled with when trying to buy a car. Uh, but it's really, you know, market-wide that we've seen these charges emerge and that we're looking to be actively addressing. Well, I want to thank you for your work and uh, hope that we talk more about some of the shared interests that we have across the aisle. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. General Lady yields back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. How timely. You are a brilliant woman with a tremendous ability to impact how consumers are going to interface with the digital world for a long time to come. And I want to get to those areas of agreement, but there is some ugliness we got to deal with. Now, you guys putting in the names of reporters in a correspondence to Twitter was solely predicated based on anonymous news sources, right? It was based on reporting that we Right, and, and we would agree that anonymous reporting is not a sufficient predicate for, to target, you know, to send letters about journalists who are your critics, right? Congressman, yeah. I mean, you know, the goal was third parties, but this is good feedback for us. We want to make sure we're not in any way suggesting that we're interested in, you know, affecting journalists' work. It's really about privacy and security. So well, I really I, appreciate, I appreciate your, your acknowledgement that that is not the way we ought to do things. As, you know, someone who has seen Government, ugly government action emerge out of anonymous reporting. Perhaps I'm a little sensitive to that, but I'm glad that um, you've made that acknowledgement. Let's get on to the important work that you are doing. Millions of Americans have ring doorbell cameras, and your agency recently, set, recently put out um, a, uh, a correspondence saying, quote, during a three-month period in 2017, a ring employee viewed thousands of videos of female users in their bedrooms and bathrooms, including videos of Ring's own employees. There was also at Ring, according to the FTC, an unauthorized tunnel that allowed a Ukraine-based contractor to access consumer videos, an incident where a Ring employee gave information about a customer's to their ex-husband was also something that you uncovered. You also state that bad actors at Ring took advantage of the camera's two-way communication functionality to harass and threaten people who used ring cameras. There was a case where an 87-year-old woman at an assisted living facility was sexually propositioned through ring's two-way two features. Kids were subject to racial slurs. A hacker got in and threatened a family with physical harm if they did not pay a Bitcoin ransom. And one hacker even communicated through the two-way feature to a customer that they had already killed the customer's mother and, quote, tonight you die. What is going on at Ring? So as you noted, we recently took enforcement action precisely because of these very serious lapses uh, in data privacy, which endangered Americans in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, overall, you know, looking at some of these surveillance devices and how they can be misused and abused is a top area of focus for us because people's privacy is paramount. Yeah, I, I thought that when people got Ring, it was to enhance their personal security, not to have their 87-year-old relative in an ALF sexually propositioned, their children to be slurred at, and then to be told that they were going to be killed if they didn't pay Bitcoin ransom. So thank you for that effort. Let's go to another evil company, Kochava. Kochava is uh, one of these data brokers that you're going after, right? That's right. And the American people should know that Kochava geolocates where people go to church, and then they sell that data to commercial enterprises, right? That's right. That's real creepy, isn't it? I believe most people would have that reaction, yes. I got onto the FBI director yesterday yeah. for their creepy FISA activity, and now we have Kochava literally selling to people, oh, well, this is a Baptist. This is a Methodist. This is someone who goes to temple. Are you going to get these people and stop them? 
so we have a pending uh, lawsuit. We filed it last year. Uh, the court dismissed it. They gave us the opportunity to refile. We just refiled an amended complaint. Uh, and we think it's urgent to act here because, you know, the types of stigmatization and harms that can stem from being able to track and sell people's sensitive geolocation information is just critical for us to be addressed. We didn't like it when the FBI was wanting to infiltrate the Catholic churches. And I don't know that I want the data brokers to do the same. And by the way, we've even seen how the FBI is using the data brokers to do an end run around the Fourth Amendment. So I really want to encourage your work in this space. And I hope that your litigation against Kochava is, an, is something that creates precedent. And you know what? If it, There's been criticism of some of your losses in court, but we as sophisticated lawyers know sometimes that a motion to dismiss an initial complaint can create a pathway to an amended complaint to achieve relief. And so if the laws are insufficient to stop data brokers from selling information about where my constituents worship, and if the laws are insufficient to stop Ring from these activities, I really hope you'll work with us to change those laws. And all of Mr. Buck's points are, are really central to this because if Congress is bought off, if people are just to come in here to beat you up over what email account you use or what trip you've been on to Europe, I think it misses these things that are far more central to the life that our constituents lead. Thank you for your work. I would just say worse than Coach Ava selling, it's the FBI is probably buying it. That's the scariest part. So agree with I, both. I, I appreciate. Well, let's uh, get a bill, Mr. Chairman, to deal with those data brokers. We're, we're going to we're working with uh, the gentle lady who just went right before you to uh, to do just that. Um, that 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 is something that I think this committee can uh, can hopefully agree on. The and I, I neglected to mention this earlier, Madam Chair. Um, we've been at this hour and a half. If you need a break at any time, just let us know. If not, well, we can keep going because we can get up and leave, but you can't. So you let us know if you need a break. With that, if, you can, if you're willing to keep going, we'll go to the gentlelady for, from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Khan, I want to start by thanking you and the FTC for your work to protect American businesses and workers and consumers on issues ranging from privacy concerns to deceptive business practices to unwanted telemarketing and robocalls. Uh, to fraud and financial exploitation that targets seniors, service members, veterans, and those in recovery from opioid disorder. Those are all really important issues, and we hear from our constituents regularly about all of that. Uh, you don't have an easy job. It's not made any easier when bogus claims are levied against you in congressional hearings. Um, every day, some of our colleagues seem to be trying to prove the legal maxim that if you don't have the law on your side, argue the facts, and if you don't have the facts either, just argue. So we appreciate your patience in responding to a lot of fact-free questions. Um, I want to focus my questions on hospital consolidation and the growing problem of private equity firms buying up hospitals and healthcare groups. In the Philadelphia region in recent years, we've had two major hospitals purchased by private equity firms, after which those firms mismanaged the healthcare functions of the hospitals, stripping them of their assets, and then either closing the hospitals or putting them up for sale. This was uh, Hahnemann Hospital in 2020, which was closed in the middle of the COVID pandemic um, after a private equity-backed real estate developer bought it. That left a gaping hole in our frontline healthcare system in one of the poorest cities in the country. And then currently, the Crozier Health System is teetering on the verge of bankruptcy while hemorrhaging talented staff and medical practices after a private equity owner stripped the system of assets, undermined its relationships with medical staff, and has reduced access to medical care, uh, particularly maternity care, emergency services, and behavioral health care. The impact on our local health care system has been so extreme we've seen local Republican politicians calling for government intervention in uh, this private equity firm's hospital business to prevent it from closing or bankrupting the system and its constituent parts. Um, we're also seeing this troubling national trend in which private equity firms have embarked on a buying spree to scoop up smaller health care groups. And there was a revealing report from the past Petra Center at UC Berkeley and the Washington Center for Equitable Growth detailing the trend of private equity firms buying up multiple doctor groups in a city and then using that consolidation to raise prices. So um, we're really concerned about this trend that's reducing access to health care and then raising prices. So what is the FTC's response to the call for more regulatory scrutiny over these transactions and how can it increase oversight and enforcement activities to ensure that we preserve market competitiveness in our health care system? 
This is such an important issue, Congresswoman. Uh, and we at the FTC, our team has done a fantastic job really addressing hospital consolidation, uh, in particular in local markets. Uh, we've had a whole set of successes really spanning um, hospitals trying to merge in ways that would have hurt patients. Our staff was able to block that transaction and the parties walked away. I think you're absolutely right, though, that today we're seeing different types of strategies, including the incursion of private equity. Uh, I recently met with some emergency medicine physicians who had come from across the country who were sharing how the incursion of private equity is really harming the quality of health care for people in very material ways. Um, so that's something that's on our radar. We're trying to figure out how do we update our tools to be able to address this. We recently issued some proposed updates to what's known as our Hart Scott Redino form. Sounds very technical, but it's basically the information that parties have to provide us when they're looking to make an acquisition. Mm -hmm. Partly, um, those changes would give us more insight into some of the type of roll-up strategies that you're mentioning so that we know on day one whether a private equity firm has this history of roll-ups that should put us on high alert. So definitely something that we're looking at closely. Okay, I've got a couple more questions on that same topic that I'll save for the next round or submit to you, but I did want to yield 30 seconds to Representative Jayapal. Thank you so much, Representative Scanlon. I just wanted to um, say quickly before I ask my question that I was not trying to attack the ethics of your ethics officer. I was trying to point out the hypocrisy of those on the other side who raise that you have a conflict of interest and don't mention uh, the other issues that might exist there. Um, I just want to go to evil actors because there's one more I really want to talk about, and that is tax preparation companies. For years, Intuit, the maker of TurboTax, flooded consumers with ads promising free, free, free tax filing services, only to trick and trap them into paying, which is why taxpayers pay $250 on average each year just for the privilege of filing their taxes. So state attorney generals have won taxpayers' money from uh, Intuit, and the FTC has also taken action. Can you just speak about that? Yeah, absolutely. So last year, the FTC uh, brought a lawsuit against Intuit for those very types of deceptive practices that are laid out in our complaint. Uh, that is still pending, but I couldn't agree more that, you know, claims of something being free, but then ultimately it not being so really hurts people. Gentlemen, time time's so expired. Gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair Khan, I'd like to begin with policies related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, that you've instituted at the FTC during your tenure. Last month, you implemented a so-called equity action plan that calls on the FTC's Bureau of Competition to, quote, update its case selection based on this new criteria. But allowing the Bureau to wade into picking cases based on these amorphous terms like equity is an idea that we believe is fraught with problems. You've also hired staff who have published articles on the topic of, quote, anti-racist antitrust. Can you explain to the committee what that means? What does that, what does that term mean? Congressman, it's not a term that I've used. Um, I can say generally, I know that there is a lot of worry that concentrated economic power hurts everybody, um, all communities, and that the FTC needs to be mindful to make sure that our work uh, is focused on the harms that is affecting everybody. Everybody, right? So anti-racism should not play a factor in competition and consumer protection policies at the FTC, right? Congressman, we bring our lawsuits based on the law at hand. Uh, we look closely at where we but might But th this is not one of the factors. Anti-racism is not going to be used under your watch, right? There are instances in which Congress has asked the FTC to look at whether particular communities are being defrauded. Uh, in those instances, we follow what Congress has told us to do. Um, but otherwise, we just follow the general laws. That's correct. Okay. A senior staffer at your FTC recently attended an event, gave a speech, and discussed, quote, applying a gender lens to antitrust, in which the senior staffer praised a cross-agency equity team. Are you applying a gender lens in the context of antitrust analysis now? To be honest, I'm not really sure what that means. We aren't either. I hope you're not using it. Um, okay, is there a cross-agency equity team? Was she accurate about that? Uh, we have a lot of cross-agency teams. Uh, there are teams that are focused on how you make the FTC a better place to work. Uh, including by making sure that certain okay, but, types but of equity is not not in your bailiwick now. You haven't there's not a you don't have a team dedicated to that, correct? We have a cross agency team that's thinking about how to make sure that the FTC is. Okay, a good she place just she work. just overspoke. Okay, I got it for time. Uh, don't you think reorienting the FTC from protecting consumers to protecting favorite groups that that idea would run counter to what the FTC's mission is? Right. I mean, you said it's it to apply to everyone, right? That's you shouldn't right. be 
uh, injecting these, um, I guess it's progressive policy initiatives that we're concerned about. The FTC has a really important mission, and we don't want you to get off course. Last year, on a party line vote, <clears throat> FTC also expanded its authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act well beyond what any previous uh, FTC has done over the last 40 years. In November 2022 policy statement, that power was expanded to unfair methods of competition that is described as, quote, conduct that goes beyond competition on the merits, and that, quote, here's the key, even when conduct is not facially unfair, it may violate Section 5. Following that decision, former Commissioner Christine Wilson stated, this is what she said, quote, the commission has now created the authority to summarily condemn essentially any business it finds distasteful. That is an extraordinary power. And it's very concerning because unfair is a, an amorphous and very subjective term by, by nature. Um, are you using Section 5 authority to determine what is unfair, even if it's not facially unfair, whatever that means? Congressman, we look very closely at the text of the statutes that Congress wrote. The text of the FTC Act instructs us to prohibit unfair methods of competition. We have to take those words seriously. When putting together that policy statement, our team looked closely at decades of case law to try to understand how have courts interpreted what this means, and the policy statement reflects that. Okay, re really quickly. Um, there's an example recently. I, I believe you're in the process of ending non-compete agreements as an unfair method of competition, and that decision could go into effect next year. Is that right? We got 24,000 comments on the proposal. Uh, we're reviewing them and determining how to move forward. Or would you favor a blanket ban on all non-compete agreements? Is that your position? So the proposal bans the vast majority of non-competes, with a few exceptions, one of which is non-competes that are included uh, as part of the sale of a business. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Have you ever run or worked in a small business? I personally have not. Yeah. So do you think it's reasonable for entrepreneurs and small businesses who spent considerable time and money developing practices to better compete against their rivals to find your ban on non-compete agreements unfair? We'll be eager to hear from them. I know we've gotten a lot of input. The other thing I'll say we hear from small businesses is that non-competes make it difficult for them to compete. Because if they're trying to enter a market and compete with some of the big guys, but the big guys have locked up all the workers through non-competes, that hurts the small businesses. So we really have heard multiple views on this issue. I'm out of time. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Beware of that profound enemy of the free enterprise system who pays lip service to free competition but labels every antitrust prosecution as a persecution. Those words are uttered by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt 90 years ago. And I've listened to most of today's hearing, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and of course we're grateful that you're here today. I've listened to the many of the criticisms that have been made by my colleagues of your leadership at the FTC on the other side of the aisle, not all my colleagues, but most of them. And the vast majority of these criticisms have nothing to do with your ethics or your integrity or your, your approach to the job and everything to do with corporate power and the realities that you have pursued your duties as the chairwoman of the FTC in a way that puts the best interests of the consumers first. And that is a new approach at the FTC. I don't want to belabor the point because I have some substantive questions for you, but uh, I'll ask for unanimous consent uh, later at the conclusion of my remarks and in, in, in our colloquy here for an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, from June 30th, 2023, the headline of which is Ethics Official Owned Meta Stock While Recommending FTC Chair Recuse Herself from Meta Case. We've spent a great deal of time hearing my colleagues talk about this particular issue. I will just simply echo the comments made by my colleague from Colorado and my friend, Mr. Buck, who I thought spoke very powerfully on this front. Only in Washington, D.C., can an individual, a regulator, who has no financial interest in the merger before her be accused of an ethics violation by members of Congress who own financial or have rather financial interests in the company that has petitioned for that or is rather proceeded with that particular merger that is under review by the FTC on the basis of an opinion that was issued that didn't conclude that there would be a per se ethics violation for uh, the commissioner in question to proceed with considering the matter 
but nonetheless uh, opined that there would be an appearance of impropriety, and of course that individual having a financial interest uh, in, the in, the, in the company uh, that was involved in the merger. And I'm not commenting, I agree with Ms. Jayapal, on the propriety of the decisions made by the ethics individual or the ethics department more broadly. I'm simply opining on the state of affairs in Washington, D.C. Because for years, we've had FTC commissioners who had real conflicts of interest. You didn't have any financial interest in Meta, right? That's correct. You've never worked for Meta? That's correct. I, the basis, as I understand it, for the objections by many of my colleagues and, and others is that you have a certain view when it comes to putting consumers first and ensuring that monopolistic power uh, does not reign supreme in our country. And I just think it's unfortunate that some of my colleagues have taken that approach. Um, I will say for my part, I'm grateful for the work that you have done at the department. I also am grateful for the work that uh, your partners uh, and, of course, other antitrust enforcement regulators, the uh, Assistant Attorney General Cantor has done uh, over the course of the last several years. Um, we, as you know, passed a bill on a bipartisan basis last year. Uh, it was my bill, the Merger Filing Fee Modernization Act, which uh, I believe is going to strengthen your efforts and your ability and the efforts of uh, your hardworking workforce within the FTC uh, by changing the fee schedule for mergers, actually decreasing the fees for smaller mergers, uh, but increasing the fees proportionally for billion-dollar transactions and giving you the resources that you need to fight for consumers on behalf of the American public. I wonder if you might uh, talk a bit about that particular bill, its implementation, and the impact it will have on agency resources. Thanks for the question, and, and thanks for your effort leading, uh, leading that bill. Uh, it was a much overdue effort to update the filing fees, and as you noted, make it clear that uh, for larger transactions, there is a higher fee. For smaller transactions, a lower fee. Uh, we, in part, rely on those fees to be able to fund our enforcement, and so that's absolutely going to be making a difference. Well, I, as I said, I'm grateful for the approach that you all are taking. I was proud to work on that bill. Uh, with Representative Buck, who has been a champion on these issues, uh, among other uh, colleagues of mine uh, on both sides of the aisle. And I think we look forward to continuing our work with you, uh, Madam Chair, for years to come on this front. With that, uh, I will yield back. The Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. I thank the chairman. Um, you know, my constituents aren't contacting me worried about uh, mergers between tech companies or that sort of thing. But one of the things I've been contacted about multiple times is the small independent grocers feel like their monopolistic practice is being used against them. And uh, Mr. Correa and I sent a bipartisan letter to you asking for an update because in November 29th, 2021, this is 17 months ago, uh, FTC ordered nine large retailers, wholesalers, and consumer goods suppliers to provide detailed information to help you study the causes behind ongoing supply chain disruptions. Um, and I appreciate you being willing to give us a, a briefing, but can you brief us today? Like, what have you found? And are you going to be able to help these folks who are complaining about they can't get products or there's discriminatory pricing, not based on quantity, but based on other things or different package sizes? What can you tell us here today? Yeah, this is such an important issue, and we've heard from those independent folks as well, um, and it's partly what informed our decision to launch this study. Uh, we're moving as expeditiously as we can. Uh, as you can imagine, sometimes firms don't have an incentive to give us all the information we need as quickly as we need it, but we are moving ahead uh, full speed and happy to be providing you with the non-public briefing to share what we've found so far, uh, and we'll be looking to make our findings public as soon as we can. I hope that's soon. There's been 17 months since you asked them to give the information. I understand it takes them a while to get it to you, but I would hope we would get that very soon. Another issue that concerns many of us are these so-called pre-consummation warning letters. Uh, on August, August 3rd, 2021, FTC announced that it would send warning letters in connection with transactions it cannot fully investigate within the time provided by the statute before the deal closes. Well, now, why should people trying to do regular business be punished because it's taking you too long to do your job? And how, how many of these so-called pre-consummation warning letters have been sent by the FTC? So the statute gives us only 30 days to look at a deal to determine whether we need to investigate it further. As deals have become more complex, that can be a very, very, very tight timeline. 
We've heard from some businesses that if we don't act within that 30-day period, the takeaway for them is that there are no issues and there are no concerns. So we thought it was important to put business on notice, to provide them clarity and transparency, that if there is a deal that we think raised concerns, but we weren't able to act within the 30 days, that we're putting them on notice about that, um, again, to make sure that the market has clarity on it. Commissioner Phillips uh, publicly suggested that within the first six months of this practice, over 50 letters were sent and raised the question of whether any of those investigations actually remained open and whether this approach was simply a tactic to scare business. I'm worried that whether it's a tactic or not, that's the effect that it's having. It's having a chilling effect. And then when you issue one of these letters and then you never tell them whether the case is closed or not, kind of without doing anything, you've stopped uh, transactions that would be helpful to Americans. Let me, uh, I want to now yield back the remainder of my time to Chairman First, Jordan. I appreciate the gentleman yielding. When the FTC attorney deposing Mr. Roke asked him to confirm that, quote, no one from the FTC directed you to reach a particular conclusion about Twitter's program, he explained to the contrary. There were suggestions of what they would expect the outcome to be. He testified that the FTC communicated to Ernst & Young. Again, Ernst & Young is the independent assessor, the fact finder that the FTC selected and made Twitter pay for, that he communicated to Ernst & Young that, quote, Ernst & Young, under all circumstances, will be conducting and issuing a report on behalf of the FTC order and was very adamant about this is absolutely what you will do and this is going to occur and you will produce a report at the end of the day. The FTC was so adamant. E uh, Ernst & Young leaders feared that the FTC would take exception if they chose to withdraw from the case. So on the one hand, you're harassing Twitter, and then you're saying the guy we've selected, the entity we've selected, Ernst & Young, the accountant we've selected to be the fact finder, you better find what we want, and if you try to get out of it, we're going to retaliate against you. That is frightening. I mean, we talk about the weaponization of government, this from the same agency that said, tell us all the journalists you're talking to, that's what we're concerned about, Ms. Khan. That's what has to change. You can comment if you want. But I'm reading from the motion filed today in court. And it, it's amazing to me, you don't even know this guy. You don't even know who this person is. And you're, you're, your lawyers deposed him. He's the guy that you set up as the fact finder, and you didn't know who he was. Did you sign off on any of those 12 letters sent to Twitter in that 10-week time frame? Uh, Congressman, we're fortunate to have a lot of work underway. Uh, a lot of this work is delegated to the frontline staff that are able to move quickly and nimbly to make sure... Yeah, but you're, you're in front of Congress today. And you knew you were going to get questions about this. Yeah, you don't know this. I, I, find, I find amazing. It sounds like it was a late-breaking development in a filing this morning. Um, it's not something that's on my radar. I'd be reluctant to weigh in on it in this setting without looking more closely at it. Happy to take questions for the record on it and engage later. Not on your radar that you told, based on the testimony of this guy, that he felt there would be retaliation if Ernst & Young tried to get out of the agreement. Wow. I, I yield back. Wow. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I now recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you. And before my five minutes, I ask unanimous consent uh, to enter into the record what Mr. Nagus had hoped to enter. Ethics official owned Meta stock while recommending FTC chair recuse herself from Meta case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chair Khan, uh, for being here, for speaking with us today about the important work that FTC does to safeguard consumers and crack down on companies that would exploit them. Uh, I come from a perspective of, as a mother, uh, as a grandmother. I care about exploitation of seniors, of children, of businesses, consumers generally. In your written testimony, you explained that FTC works to protect privacy and data security, fight fraud, including fraud related to opioid recovery, and ensure that domestic manufacturers and small businesses have a chance to compete fairly. Somehow, Republicans are using this time in other ways. I apologize. I'm late to the hearing today, but I'm pretty sure I'm glad I missed some of what happened. I was in another hearing with Secretary Kerry on the climate crisis, so forgive me for coming late. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the issue around opioid uh, addiction uh, and abuse and what FTC is doing. I know that FTC uh, recently returned $60 million to people suffering from opioid addiction. I know you know as well as I that the crisis, the health crisis, public health crisis in this country, 
around the flood of opioids and opioid addiction is grave. 110,000 people died last year of overdose. That's 300 people a day. Can you tell us about your work, FTC's work, to try to protect consumers? Maybe this case, the $60 million case with uh, Rectic, I don't know how to say that. Um, can you tell us about your work in that area? Yeah, happy to. And we were, um, you know, this is a newer authority that Congress gave us, and I've been pleased that we've been able to quickly put it into action. Uh, we brought a set of lawsuits uh, using this, this authority to make sure that if companies are deceiving potential patients of opioid uh, recovery facilities, that we are acting quickly to prevent that deception. Uh, we brought a case against uh, a firm called R360 uh, because we found that they were engaging in some of these deceptive practices in ways that were harming uh, opioid recovery patients. Uh, we recently brought another action that also noted that deception around tobacco uh, addiction recovery is also illegal under the statutory authority. So we're working hard to make sure if people are being deceived in ways that are illegal under this authority, we're acting and we're getting the money back. Well, I thank you for that work. I hope you will continue in a robust way. And for full disclosure, I have a son in long-term recovery, 10 years in recovery from opioid addiction. Uh, we've lost too many others uh, to this, this problem. And the deceptive practices are so uh, egregious, um, that it's, it's very upsetting. Um, I wanted to move to, uh, if I have some time, I do, good. Uh, pharmacy benefit managers. They operate behind the scenes. Consumers don't really know what they're all about. They're a middleman in the drug market and determine patients' access to medications as well as the prices consumers pay. In this role, PBMs have the power to raise prices and are part of the reason that consumers pay 20% more uh, than they should for generic drugs. Can you speak to what FTC is doing around the issue of PBMs and disclosure to consumers and cracking down uh, on the, the price hikes? You're absolutely right that these firms are oftentimes behind the scenes, so people are not directly interacting with them, but oftentimes their decisions are determining what medicines make it onto what's known as the formulary. Right. And unfortunately, we've heard uh, reports that suggest that you know, rebates between you know, the drug manufacturers and the PBMs may be keeping lower cost generics off the formularies. So what that means in practice is there's a lower cost generic out there, but when a patient is going to the pharmacy, they're not actually able to get it. They're having to pay more for the branded drug. And so, you know, we've said in our policy statement, we are very concerned about that and are looking at it. And yes, and how can we interrupt that? Can FTC have uh, some rulemaking, some effectiveness in interrupting that, that blockage of information to the consumer? So we're looking closely at whether, you know, there may be violations of the FTC Act. Uh, the Robinson-Patman Act also prohibits certain types of kickbacks, uh, I believe under 2C of the Robinson-Patman Act. So we're really laying out all of our authorities and making sure we're using them to address these issues because, you know, oftentimes we hear from insulin patients about how they haven't been able to afford life-saving medicine uh, potentially because some of these tactics. So we recognize the urgency of this work. Again, on behalf of consumers and seniors and kids out there, thank you for your work and the work of your entire team. I yield back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I will say I wrote down something you said. I, I think I got the quote exactly right. I wrote it down because not only was it, I think, sub substantively meritorious, but also was alliterative. Uh, people's privacy is paramount, close quote. If only the FBI leadership believed and acted that same way, I would be, I would be happy. I want to ask you first about the EU's Digital Markets Act. You previously commented and opined in response to Mr. Klein's questioning. He asked you how much spent. I think you said you don't know. I wonder how many... Uh, employees or personnel are working to, uh, on the EU Digital Markets Act? So my understanding is we currently have one employee that's detailed uh, to Brussels. Uh, these details are routine. They've gone on for many years. Uh, they help improve, you know, coordination what? among agencies for us to better understand. Are you, are, is that employee working to help implement the EU Digital Marketing Act, or are they just observing what's what's what are the, what's their role there so 
is a general matter when we do these details. They're focused on antitrust enforcement, uh, enforcement of the competition laws. This is uh, in Europe, though. This is implementation of a new law. So, these so how, is that, how does that impact antitrust law in the United States of America? So these laws, as you noted, govern Europe. Uh, if the European Commission is working on implementing them, that's work that they're doing. Uh, our work is focused on enforcing the U.S. laws, these types of details across agencies. Right, but that, 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 that begs the question, and I, I'm looking for... Uh, I'll, I'll move on because we always five, the five-minute format is ridiculously absurd. We can't get a full answer or full question. So I'm hoping that maybe you or your team will respond more fulsomely as to to why we have someone there even obs even observing the implementation of an EU law that um, is not here, unless you're intending to support something like that here. Uh, are you familiar with someone named Rebecca Kelly Slaughter? Excuse me? Are you familiar with someone named uh, Becky? Yes, she is my colleague. Uh, yes, right Becky. there. She's here. So I, I have a quote from her. Interesting. Well, glad you're here. Um, she's called for an equity, inclusion, and anti-racist agenda in the antitrust enforcement. Yet antitrust enforcement typically is focused on the consumer welfare standard, right? So do you, do you agree with uh, Ms. Slaughter, Commissioner Slaughter's call for equity, inclusion, and anti-racist uh, approach to antitrust, antitrust enforcement. So let me say, first of all, it's just such a huge privilege to serve on the commission alongside Commissioner Slaughter. She thought she has thought so hard about how do we make sure we're using so all of our That's tools. beautiful. We only have five minutes. I, send me a letter telling me how um, glad you are, please. But please uh, respond to my question. So she's thought an enormous amount of these issues, and I won't um, claim to speak for her. The way I'm I not asking you to speak for her. I'm asking whether you agree that that is the appropriate approach and in a, it, it, when it's a, a de facto departure from the consumer welfare standard. So we enforce the laws that Congress charged us with. Uh, that includes prohibitions on unfair methods of competition. Uh, so so not, 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 not to interrupt, but to interrupt, um, you're not answering my question. My question is real specific. Do you support and agree with this new approach, which was what it would be, because it'd be a departure from the consumer welfare standard? Do you agree with Ms. Slaughter's call for equity, inclusion, and anti-racist as a basis to, uh, to examine antitrust violations? So again, we examine antitrust violations under the laws that Congress wrote. Can you name a single law de dealing with antitrust that obviates the consumer welfare standard and replaces it with an equity, inclusion, and anti-racist standard? Um, Any statute? The statute Federal or statute. The statutes are worded broadly. We look closely at the text of them as well as any case law. Can, can give me one that would that would facilitate uh, obviating the the uh, consumer welfare standard and replacing it with the equity, inclusion, and anti-racist standard. So, Congressman, look, you're right. There aren't you know cases on these specific questions. I will say, when Congress was passing the anti-monopoly laws, they were doing so because they were worried that concentrations of economic power hurt everybody. That's and right. That's, that's right. That but they, that's that's from that point of view is from is how the consumer welfare standard developed and evolved. And now this if you were to take the the equity inclusion anti-racist agenda and use that as your new standard, you would have moved away from statutory and case law and tried to impose a new standard. That's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, and that's the point you're not responding to. I would ask that maybe uh, you or Ms. Lauder even, I don't, you know, whatever, uh, would respond uh, in the future so we have a chance to, to get to the bottom of that. And I appreciate you being here. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do want to start by uh, commending um, Congressman Buck and Gates uh, for their comments earlier today. I was... Uh, Pleasantly surprised to hear the uh, affirmative comments they made with respect to the FTC, but also legislation they're working on with Ms. Jayapal that I think is important and critical legislation uh, that could be very useful. I kind of note that we haven't had hearings on legislation like that. Uh, we've had a lot of hearings for, uh, you know, the weaponization issues and a lot of uh, hearings trying to attack the Biden administration in various ways. We haven't had any hearings on affirmative legislation that would have an impact on, on people 
uh, in these markets. And I'm on the antitrust subcommittee, and um, I think we've had two hearings there. We had one, uh, Mr. Massey, put together that dealt with uh, agriculture issues. I think it was meatpacking and small uh, entities. But it wasn't as ex explicitly an antitrust hearing. It just, it just so happened that the witnesses at the table noted that the big four companies that are dominating uh, that industry are the ones that are crushing small farmers and running them out of business and increasing prices. But, uh, and I requested at the hearing some, so some sort of uh, approach that would try and address that concern, but uh, nothing's come back yet. And I, I would note this, too. We've got matters pending, uh, you know, in the United States here before your commission or, uh, you know, Department of Justice. Some of it have been mentioned today already, the PBMs, Ticketmaster, JetBlue, uh, Kroger-Albertson merger, the MS, uh, Microsoft uh, matter that was handled yesterday. The subcommittee on antitrust has had no hearings on any of those issues whatsoever. Um, so I know this is an oversight hearing with respect to the FTC, but might make sense if we take a moment and have a little oversight for ourselves on what's going on here on the subcommittee. A few minutes ago, um, it was raised that um, about a subpoena that the FTC had issued, and the, uh, I guess the comment was that it was overbroad. But I, I did want to raise this as well. The, the Judiciary Committee um, on May 25th, 2023, sent a, 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 a document demand to the Department of Justice that, that demanded, and I'm quoting, all documents and communications between or among the Department of Justice and the Internal Revenue Service referring or relating to any investigations involving both the Department of Justice and Internal Revenue Service from May 1, 2023 to the present. Now, we'll set aside for a fact, uh, for a moment, that that would include grand jury materials, potentially, which of course they can't turn over, based on a letter like this, even from Congress. But if we're going to throw rocks, let's make sure we're, we're, we're not in the glass house, because that is beyond overbroad. Uh, and I think it's these, and this isn't, I just picked one out of many, but there's a lot of requests that this committee has sent out uh, to the administration, and in some instances to private companies, depending on whether they're on the good side of the Republicans or not. Um, and I think we should be very careful and making sure we're using the power of the committee uh, and the House of Representatives in an appropriate way, just like they're asking the FTC to do. Uh, and then I, I did want to close with this point. Uh, that's with respect to uh, the recusal issue. That's been discussed quite a bit. Um, and I, I think it's been addressed in, in Judge Boasberg's opinion, I thought made it crystal clear uh, why you didn't need to recuse yourself. And in fact, he said, it, in judging the, the motions that had been filed to him, um, that it wasn't necessary or, or even appropriate. But at the same time, this committee, again, is ignoring one of the most obvious issues with respect to recusal and ethics, and that's with respect to the Supreme Court. Um, you know, uh, we had 35 members send a letter to the speaker and to the committee chair raising the issues, and I, we've all heard of them. Uh, Justice Thomas, and you know, he's got billionaires buying property from his mother and taking him on yacht trips and, and, and the like. And Justice Alito had uh, similar sorts of issues. Uh, we sent a letter to both uh, the speaker and the committee chair asking to have hearings, that we should take a look at a code of conduct for the Supreme Court justices, um, that we should consider whether uh, there should be rules in place with respect to recusal for, for members of Congress. To the best of my knowledge, there's been no response to this letter. Uh, but more importantly, no steps that have been taken to try and address the issues that uh, have been made very obvious by the conduct of Justice Thomas and Justice Alito. And that's just the beginning. So uh, I, I would move for unanimous consent to have um, an op-ed from Jesse Wegman. Does Justice Alito hear himself? Uh, and then Daniel Bogoslaw, I think, Samuel Alito's wife leased land to an oil and gas firm with the Justice uh, while the justice fought the EPA. And then the letter from uh, the state of April 17th to uh, Honorable Kevin McCarthy and Honorable Jim Jordan, and this from 35 plus members of, of the House. I would ask that all of these, these be made uh, part of the record. Objection. Gentleman from California's, the gentleman yields back, gentleman from California's recognized. 
Uh, Ms. Kahn, there's a Wall Street Journal column written by Christine Wilson. Uh, she resigned from the FTC because of a range of concerns over how you discharge your duties. But what caught my attention was the censoring of her dissent in the uh, meta-acquisition case. Uh, you know, severe disagreements around here are par for the course. I mean, we go to great lengths every day on this committee to, to, to demonstrate that. But we sort out our differences by freely exchanging our views, confident uh, that this process will separate truth from lies, uh, wisdom from folly. A free society depends on people knowing the difference for themselves. Um, censoring speech is utterly destructive of this process. Can you explain why Commissioner Wilson's dissent criticizing your conduct was censored? Uh, so, Congressman, I couldn't agree more that that type of debate and discussion is critical. Uh, Congress designed the FTC as a multi-member commission, and we really enjoy internally those discussions and debates. Well, obviously not, because her comments were dis in her dissent were censored. So why was that? How do you explain that? So the way the commission procedures work is that I was walled off from those decisions. As the majority of the um, commission explained, they were identifying non-public information relating to staff analysis and material protected by deliberative process that we have longstanding FTC policy adopted during the Reagan administration that says we don't disclose that type of analysis because we don't want to chill. Well, this was specifically criticisms of you. Did you, did you have any uh, discussions with your colleagues over this? No, again, I was totally walled off from the proceeding. So wh what do you see as the role of government in determining what is misinformation or, for that matter, hate speech? Uh, you know, the FTC is focused on deceptive advertising. So I guess, you know, if a company says something is made in America, but it's actually made in China, that, from our perspective, is fraud and deceptive. Well, you, you were discussing Twitter uh, just a, a about an hour ago. Uh, do you see the government having any role in determining what is misinformation or what is hate speech? We're not involved with that. Again, we're focused on deceptive advertising like made in USA fraud, and that's really what we're focused on. Let me ask you, what's your view of capitalism? Excuse me? What's your view of capitalism? Uh, you know, the FTC's job is to promote competition. Oh, no, what's your view of capitalism? Could you explain what you mean by that term? Good system, bad system, what do you see as its strengths and weaknesses? So I think open, competitive, robust, resilient markets are critical to America's economic success, and the FTC has the honor of playing a really important role in ensuring that our markets are open and competitive and position the America to compete globally. Of course, the, the beauty of a capitalist system is the fact that consumers every day uh, vote with every dollar they spend on what the economy will produce and at what prices they're willing to pay. Um, do you uh, uh, see a role in government in, in, in interposing its judgment for theirs? The role of the FTC is really one of a referee. Uh, we believe in open competitive markets, but in order for these markets to deliver good outcomes, we need to make sure the companies are playing by the rules of fair competition. That's the job that Congress gave the FTC, and that's what we do. Yeah, well, I, I think you, you go much farther than that, and I, I certainly hope that you'll take to heart the, the economic criticisms uh, that, that you've heard today. Uh, you know, mergers, for example, generally occur when companies determine that it's going to improve their efficiency and productivity and, and hence their ability to serve their, their, their consumers. And that grows the economy, and it, it uh, helps consumers. And I'd urge you to be very careful, and your colleagues, very careful and very humble with your powers, because when your decisions harm the economy, you're also harming your administration. Uh, the average consumer might not follow the day-to-day -day decisions of your commission, but they know how they're doing in their own lives. And I'll yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Um, uh I'll wait, but I appreciate, the, I appreciate the gentleman yielding, but we'll, we'll And then I'll wait. yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from North, North Carolina. Okay, North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chair Khan, for joining us today. Um, and also thank you for mentioning your work on PBM reform in your opening statement. 
This is a very important issue for our healthcare industry and, as you pointed out, for the health of our constituents. This Congress, I've been working with a bipartisan coalition of lawmakers to address abusive and exclusionary practice, pricing practices by pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs. Access to affordable prescription drugs is a critical issue for all Americans. And I'm hopeful that the FTC will take substantive steps to address the ways in which PBMs take advantage of patients and providers in their pricing strategies. I know that you got a general question from Congresswoman Dean a little bit earlier, but I, to be much more specific, um, the FTC has been working on a 6B study since June of 2022. When do you anticipate completing that study, and do you have any interim conclusions or findings that you can share with us today? Thanks, Congresswoman. As I noted, you know, we recognize very deeply the urgency of this work because it potentially means that patients are not getting access to affordable medicines and that, as we all know, can have life or death consequences. So we're moving with great haste. Uh, we're dependent on the companies to provide us information in a timely way. Uh, we're trying to drive that forward as much as we can in general. Um, you know, historically, some of these studies at the agency have taken four years, five years. Uh, my goal is for us to be able to move more expeditiously. I should also note that if, as a matter of course, during this inquiry, we instead identified practices that we would determine are unlawful, nothing would stop us from being able to focus on some of those law violations and proceed on the enforcement track instead. Great. Um, and then also the FTC recently expanded the scope of its PBM investigation to include group purchasing organizations or GPOs that have opened in recent years. How does the FTC believe that PBMs might be using these GPOs and what kind of harm could they have in the market for affordable drugs? So GPOs are um, another one of these kind of you know, entities that are not visible to consumers but play a really central middleman role in the market. Uh, we've you know, sent out these additional requests because we want to make sure that we're getting a full 360 view of what's happening with these practices. I should also note uh, we've all read stories about major shortages of critical drugs. Uh, we've also received letters and input suggesting that the role of the GPOs may also be contributing to some of those shortages of essential medicines. So that's something that's on our radar as well. Great. And that give, given that the three large um, PBMs are currently, um, they cur currently control 80% of the market, I'm interested in how consolidation within PB, the PBM industry affects patient access and costs. In addition to this PBM consolidation, the lar largest drug plan sponsors also own their own PBMs. So we're seeing a great deal of vertical integration as well. We know that PBMs set out to pocket costs based on full, undiscounted lists price of drugs, so patients don't see a lot of the PBM discounts at the pharmacy counter. And we know that some health plan-owned PBMs require patients to fill prescriptions only at certain pharmacies or providers, which reduces access. How are you seeing this consolidation and vertical integration uh, impacting patients? Yeah, it's such a great point. And, you know, this is one of the issues on which we're routinely hearing from people. Uh, we opened a docket to kind of collect input around what people are seeing about PBM practices. We received thousands of patients, uh, thousands of public comments, many of them from patients who were concerned that some of these decisions about which medicines the PBMs are putting on the formulary or are not putting on is not being driven by what's best for the patient, but is instead potentially being driven by which is going to give the, the PBM the highest rebate. Um, so I think that could be an in, instance where there's a conflict of interest between what's in the PBM's own interest and what's best for patients. Um, so that's something that we've heard a lot about. And final quick question. Do you see a role for Congress in this area as well, not just what your agency does? Absolutely. I mean, this is such an urgent problem relating to unaffordable drug prices for Americans that I think it's an all-hands-on-deck moment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. 
I thank the chairman, uh, Ms. Khan. Thanks for coming here to testify before the committee. Uh, would you commit to me to provide all updates necessary with respect to the Live uh, Golf PGA Tour merger and you're all uh, looking into whatever is occurring with that? So, Congressman, I believe it's our partners at the Justice Department that are looking at that. The FTC is also having some look into what's going on there, to what at least the news accounts I see. But I just appreciate any updates from your office about that and the concerns about it. And I'm going to yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Thank the gentleman for uh, thank the gentleman for for yielding, um, Ms. Khan. Uh, earlier, and and I believe the gentleman from Arizona brought this up. You said people's privacy is paramount. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. And as we we talked earlier, I do think there's bipartisan support to to deal with that. This this sweeping up of data that happens, and scarier yet is 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 FBI purchasing that data. So that is of paramount importance. But I would I would say the First Amendment's of paramount importance too. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, and then the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, asked you, what's, what's disinformation? And you said you don't really have an opinion on that. Is that, was that, is that a fair assessment of your answer? Uh, as part of our job at the FTC, we're focused on deception and fraud and, and that sort of thing. Well, you wrote a couple years ago in a, in a law review article, digital businesses such as Twitter disserve their users by facilitating the spread of disinformation. What were you talking about there then? What's, what's disinformation? Uh, I'm happy to take a closer look at the material you're mentioning, but, um, you know, as part of our work at the FTC, we've seen how fraud and scams can sometimes proliferate on these social media websites. Uh, we've launched an inquiry to try to understand, you know, why are some of these crypto scams really proliferating on these sites and what can we be doing? So the, these are the first two sentences in the introduction of the piece you wrote. Again, just a couple years ago, digital businesses such as Twitter disserve their users by facilitating the spread of disinformation. Who decides what's disinformation? From the FTC's perspective, it's deception, uh, deception and fraud. No, that that's fine. You can keep here. using synonyms, but I want to know who decides that it's deception, who decides that it's fraud, who decides that it's disinformation. In this case, you're talking about social media companies and what gets posted on their platform. Who decides what's disinformation, what isn't? So, Congressman, again, at the FTC, we're focused on fraud and deception. There is a legal standard about what constitutes fraud. Again, this is about... But you didn't say fraud or deception, you said disinformation. And my concern is, my concern is, again, and I've, it's probably the third time I've talked about this, but the sustained attack on Twitter when the ownership there changed and the platform was committed to not taking down speech, not taking down posts, allowing the sharing of information, uh, and not censoring information. And we just had a, a major decision last week from a court in Louisiana, a federal court in Louisiana, where they said the government was, in fact, pressuring big tech companies to censor, and big tech companies were willing to go along with it. Now we have a change there, and you're going after the one company that's changed how they're doing things. That's what concerns me, particularly in light of the fact that you just wrote about this a few years ago, saying this is what goes on. Congressman, uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to clarify some issues here. So we at the FTC have no view on who should or should not own a company. All we care about is that the company is following the law. That's really what our focus we've is. Been, we've, we've covered that ground. I want to know. I want to know about disinformation and who decides what's disinformation. You think the government should decide that, Congressman? The way I see it is concentrations of economic power including over speech platforms and communications platform, that it's that concentrated power and the ability to pick who gets heard, who doesn't get heard, to make these types of decisions. That, I think, is concerning to all of us, and the FTC's job is to be promoting... You know what kind of speech was getting censored? Do you know what the court said last week? What kind of, have you read the opinion, by the way? I have not. It did not concern the FTC. You know what kind of, you know what kind of speech was, was getting censored? You know what the court said? Conservative speech. Conservative speech was what was all, the, the suppression was virtually all conservative. This is not Jim Jordan talking about, it's not Republicans on the Judiciary Committee talking about, this is the, the federal judge who had the facts, 86 pages of facts, and laid out, put the facts and the law together in this opinion, strong opinion, which said it was a conservative speech that was get, getting censored and labeled as disinformation. So, Congressman, I fully understand why, given the extreme concentration of power over some of these speech platforms, why people would be afraid and worried about censorship. I couldn't agree more that when you have a handful of people making decisions about what gets seen, what doesn't get seen, what, who and gets And you think heard. the remedy to that is for government to lay, decide what's disinformation and what, what's not? 
Congressman, at the FTC, our job is to promote competition. More competition means more people making these decisions, and I think that can alleviate some of the concerns about censorship that you're sharing. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Chair, I recognize the gentleman is Georgia, or yes, okay. I didn't know who had walked in first, or how are we going? The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Chair Khan. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you before us today. I have read your testimony. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Um, ensuring that emerging American businesses have an opportunity oh. to grow and to thrive is essential for our economy. And one of the most uh, of American of practices, so to speak, America is a country that is built on the success of creative and innovative ideas. The determination of grit of its people is so vital. And the endless opportunities of its society. And for these reasons, we must do all that we can in our power to support competition, as you just mentioned, and fight monopolies which crush American opportunities. A robust antitrust framework supports small businesses by helping to ensure that they are not intimidated into conciliation. It empowers the American people by allowing them freedom of choice in the marketplace. A robust antitrust framework strengthens American workers against monopolistic efforts to lower wages and eliminate their benefits. That is why it's so wonderful to have you here today. Thank you so much for being here at the helm of the FTC. You, you have actually been a champion of enforcing America's antitrust and competition laws for years. And America's economy is much stronger for it. And in fact, the U.S. has the highest post-pandemic growth of any nation in the G7 and the lowest inflation, with a historic low unemployment rate of 3.7 percent, and that must be noted here today. As I spoke on earlier, enforcement of antitrust laws helps to promote fair competition across the United States uh, economy while protecting consumers and workers from deceptive and unfair practices. Balancing competition and effective antitrust Enforcement are critical to protecting our consumers, our workers, innovation, and economic equity in this country. Over the past 20 years, the U.S. has seen consolidation across all markets, whether it be in a nursing home industry, tech industry, or ag agriculture industry. Can you please comment on how this is applied in the context of large mergers that affect smaller competitors in the marketplace? So, Congresswoman, when we see mergers between two large firms, especially if they're competing in the same market, um, that can make it more difficult for newer entrants to come into the market. Uh, we've seen how entry barriers can be raised, and independent firms, small businesses, uh, can have a difficult time really competing on a level playing field if the merger is leading to market power that allows the merged firms to get special types of terms or discriminatory benefits that are not available to others. Thank you. So these past two terms, Congress has actually been examining the role of big tech companies and their um, exercise of market dominance, which has allowed them to make a profit and to leverage their gatekeeper power over small or new companies and competitors. Can you talk about the steps that you are taking to ensure smaller companies, especially in the tech marketplace, get a fair chance to compete against bigger, more entrenched companies? So the FTC has been looking closely at digital markets uh, since before I joined the commission. Uh, one of um, the first actions that we took when I joined was refiling uh, the FTC's amended complaint against Facebook, where the FTC is alleging that Facebook's acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp were anti-competitive and really helped Facebook maintain its dominance in ways that locked out uh, rivals and really hurt consumers at the end of the day. Uh, we're continuing to look closely at mergers and acquisitions uh, to make sure that if we worry that these acquisitions are similarly going to create dominance and allow firms to maintain their monopoly, that we're acting swiftly there. So under your tenure, FTC has endeavored to restore meaningful antitrust law enforcement over the last two years. And in this process, the FTC has made some powerful enemies. Have you not? 
Yes, you, you have. We I can hear answer from that for uh, you. a lot of folks, yes. So isn't the lesson learned here that antitrust agencies should trust uh, vigorous competition and antitrust enforcement to do, deliver innovation and better services rather than enabling uh, entrenched gatekeepers to continue growing through acquisition and markets? Absolutely. I think uh, America's history shows that when we promote fair and open competition, that's what best produces innovation and allows us to succeed. Thank you, and I'm out of time. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin for five minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm not going to take five minutes. I'm just going to take a real brief time here. Um, we heard some of the same pablum yesterday. I don't have a question for the witness, but we heard some of the same stuff from the FBI yesterday that, boy, we respect the Constitution and all the rest. And, um, but nonetheless, they are ending up censoring the American people. And it was so interesting to hear yesterday when um, um, the director of the FBI was here and he said, well, these companies work within the free market. Um, we can't change how they um, go about operating. But when you have a federal agency, whether it's the FBI or the FTC, that comes calling at your front door and they say, gosh, um, you know, maybe you should be doing things a little bit differently, they pay attention. And I would use the example of the man who originated uh, Facebook. He said on a podcast in the last year that in regards to the FBI, when they come calling, you're going to pay attention. And censorship happens from there. And I hope that you are cognizant of that as you go about doing your business. Second thing that I would say is that we talked about, you know, entrenched gatekeepers and stuff like that. The barriers to entry that have been built here in Washington, D.C. over the um, last few decades are significant. And I would go back to two major bills that are over a decade old now. One being Obamacare, the other one being Dodd-Frank. We see probably the least entrepreneurship that has happened in the healthcare and finance banking industries that we've seen in decades because the barriers to entry are so high. And I sure hope that you will respect that, that you, uh, while building these regulations out here, while passing laws as happened over a decade ago in regards to Obamacare and uh, Dodd-Frank, it has harmed the rest of America. It's harmed entrepreneurs. It's harmed Main Street America when they no longer have a bank with their bank being consolidated into something that's bigger. So you may say that, boy, we're going to go after these big companies. Well, hell, we created them here. And I hope you won't participate in creating additional barriers to entry so that entrepreneurs cannot participate in the free market society that was built in the United States of America over the last nearly 250 years. I'll yield back. Thank you. A um, couple questions I had. I just wanted, using a little bit of this time there. The gentleman from Georgia mentioned that he thought you were being treated unfairly, if you remember at the beginning, we asked about an hour and a half ago, and differently because of your ethnicity and because of your color. Do you believe that's true? Congressman, I'm focused on really I know you are, but diligently just diligently the questions you all are asking, I won't. I know, but I, I'm just curious. Do you believe that's true? Because if you watch the hearing, I was offended by it, to be honest with you. If you watch the hearing yesterday, we gave a, a, a gentleman a, a pretty thorough raking over, asking some difficult questions. Um, and I hope that you know it has nothing to do with ethnicity or color. And I hope you don't feel that way. And I was wondering if you do. It's a yes a or point no. point of order. Yes. Oh. Mr. Chair, just wondering whose time we're using right he now. He yielded back his time to me. Okay. And he had time you. left over. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tiffany. Yes, go ahead. Just give me a yes or no. Do you think you're being treated fairly? It sounds like there's a robust debate um, uh, among the committee about these issues, and I defer to you all. Uh, to well, you know, that. one of the things I love to change is that when we ask people to say yes or no, they would. It's so hard when people come before us. Um, and I just wanted to say one other thing, too, and then we will move on. Um, robocalls. I know you heard about them today. It's a really big deal. You want to talk about a way that you're 
affecting people's lives. They are sophisticated. They're scary. People are getting in trouble because of them and everything from Social Security to buying timeshares. It is a really big problem. I would love to, and I'm going to speak to Mr. Correa, I would love to work with him across the aisle, love to work with whomever to do something about that issue. I have other questions for you later, but at this point I'll recognize the gentlelady from Missouri. Thank you. Uh, St. Louis and I are here today in strong support of the rights of workers, of consumers, small businesses, and the broader public to be free from corporate greed that monopolizes our access to information and treats employees and communities as expendable. Thank you for being here, Chair Khan. I appreciate your service as a staffer on this committee, your brown, groundbreaking scholarship on antitrust law and anti-monopoly issues, and your record of accomplishments as FTC Chair. The Commission has an important role to play in protecting our economy from the harms caused by greedy, reckless corporations that put profit and power over people. Look at big tech, big pharma, big oil, and any other concentrated industry. These companies and the profit-obsessed executives behind them have abused their power for too long, and it's time that they be held accountable. So we absolutely need to level the playing field for workers and consumers. The FTC can and is trying to help under your leadership. And I appreciate that because it makes a real difference in communities like mine. For example, in recent years, FTC lawsuits have resulted in more than $33 million provided to more than 178,000 Missourians. In 2020 alone, the FTC provided $8.6 million to people in Missouri, including St. Louis. That's real money for real people harmed by corporate greed. It's food on the table, it's a roof over a head, it's clothing for a child. Another example is the FTC's proposed rule to ban non-compete agreements. Chair Khan, as was brought up earlier, banning non-compete agreements is estimated to raise wages by over $200 billion each year and to close racial and gender wage gaps by up to 9.1%. Is that correct? Congresswoman, as we laid out in our notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, those are some of the estimated effects, yes. Thank you. Uh, it's a lot of money in the pockets of workers and black and brown people and women in particular. Can you explain specifically how banning non-compete uh, agreements means workers will get paid more? So what our staff did is they looked very closely at the empirical evidence uh, that has now um, surfaced in light of the different state policies that we've seen. And what we've seen is that states that have limited non-competes um, are able to ensure that workers are moving them around more freely, uh, though unfortunately we still see that all too often companies are still trying to include non-competes. What we've also seen is that being able to switch jobs, being able to move freely between jobs and get better job opportunities is a key mechanism that workers have to use to be able to get higher wages and better employment opportunities. When you freeze workers in place, when you lock them in place through these non-competes, that means that they're not able to go across the street even though the firm across the street is offering them better wages or better working conditions, um, and that's bad for workers. Absolutely. Thank you, and that's a real impact that will save lives. Um, but. Republicans don't like this. The party that is in the pocket of white supremacists and wealthy corporations will talk a big game about fighting for everyday people and then show up to Congress and do whatever their corporate donors want them to do. That's what these attacks, that's what this is about. So let me be clear. There is nothing unethical about standing up for workers, consumers, and small businesses. There is nothing unethical about enforcing the law against powerful and destructive companies like Amazon, Meta, and Twitter. There is nothing unethical about putting your principles into practice. But what's unethical is being apologists for the corporate greed that is fleecing our communities. What's unethical is claiming to care about workers and then selling them out. That's the real ethics scandal here, and we need not forget it. The bottom line is that the corporate monopolies 
Corporate monopolies are a recipe for social destruction. Any lawmakers who claim to stand for workers and consumers must advocate against dominance by large private companies that care more about profit than people. We need to aggressively enforce our antitrust laws for the purposes Congress intended, and we also need to move beyond the digital economy dominated by billionaire-owned for-profit companies. Chair Khan, you have never tried to hide who you are or what you believe, and I admire you for that. I thank you for your leadership, and I look forward to working with you and your agency on these critical issues. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Khan, is this working? Doesn't sound, yeah, I guess I hear it. Um, I, I, someone pointed out to me that just this morning the FTC, well, it was, it was disclosed the FTC sent a, a, a civil investigative demand to open AI. Are you familiar with that? Um, Congressman, this uh, involves non-public information, um, but, you know, if it's been publicly reported, then um, it may be accurate, but I'm hesitant I mean that, to share anything non-public in this it's, it's being, it's, it's on Twitter, and, and among, uh, it seems to be uh, asking, among other things, for whether uh, chat GPT or the, that, or whatever other products they have would generate um, statements about persons. Can you explain the gist of that or what is the regulatory authority of the FTC that is, that it is, that, that civil investigative demands being issued under? So as a general matter, some of the concerns that we're seeing in this AI space is that chat GPT and some of these other services are being fed a huge trove of data there are no checks on what type of data is being inserted into these companies, and we've heard about reports where people's sensitive information is showing up in response to an inquiry from somebody else. Uh, we've heard about, you know, libel, defamatory statements, flatly untrue things that are emerging. Um, that's the type of fraud and deception that we're concerned about. So as a general proposition, so, so, and you just said something, you spoke to libel and, and uh, slander or defamation issues, and... And I'm going to come to that because that's an issue of state law, as I understand it. But is your regulatory reach there defined by, you know, the FTC Act? Is that the basis under which you guys explore, investigate that stuff, that stuff with a company like OpenAI? So it's absolutely true that we don't directly address those things. We're focused on is there substantial injury to people. Yeah. Injury can look like all sorts of things. So, so like, I, and you were speak, speaking earlier in communication with the chairman or, or, or your colloquy with the chairman about it's Twitter, the Twitter background of releasing private information. Was that also subject to your regulatory reach under the FTC Act because it was somehow deceptive? Or is there some other statutory source that generally puts you guys in charge of you know, sensitive information about people. Yes, it's the FTC Act that prohibits unfair or deceptive practices and unfair methods of competition. That's primarily the authority we've used in these instances. Okay, and and that, you know, that's interesting. And I, just for the people in the public, the, the operative language of Section 5 that you guys, I think, are using there and in the context of the uh, non-compete uh, rule that you're, you've come out with, and says, just says, unfair methods of competition in or affecting commerce and unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce are hereby declared unlawful, right? That's the language? That's right. Yeah. And so that, it's not really very detailed. Let me ask you for a minute about the non-compete rule. So you guys have this proposed rule you're seeking comments on, administrative process, then uh, once those comments are, are reviewed, you guys will decide, the FTC will decide whether to proceed with the final rules. Is that the way it works, basically? That's correct. And, um, and, and so in that case, I, I litigated these kinds of contracts in state law for 30 years and, uh, in North Carolina. I know California has a rule that absolutely bans them. They're different, different uh, renditions of law, some statutory, some made, up, made by the courts over time in states all over the country, and there have been for a long, long time. So what your rule would do would displace all of that state contract law in one fell swoop if it were made final, wouldn't it? It would create a new floor, yes. It would create a, create a what? It would cre yes, it would be creating uh, a new provision that would be determining that these non-competes are um, are ruled unlawful. So, so you would not only ref and it would and it would be per se. It was I know some of the stuff stated in your notice of proposed rulemaking uh, that I've glimpsed said it would be you know that you saw these as inherently coercive or the product un of unequal bargaining power, but. The rule would be per se, except for a very narrow category, or the overwhelming majority would be per se, even if the people involved in, in those contracts wanted to make them, right? 
That's the proposal. Uh, we did ask as part of our notice of proposed rulemaking some questions about whether there are adjustments we okay. should make. And I don't want to get into the minor details because we've only got about 30 seconds left. Let me just ask you this, because if you take that example uh, or many of the others have been talked about, you, you spoke a moment ago about being concerned about concentrations of economic power. I get that. Isn't there a basis to be concerned about concentration of legal power, lawmaking power? So you got 30,000 state judges have made those rules. You got 7,558 state legislators. You got lots of members of Congress. You got multiple chambers in Congress. The fact that you really, as the you know, bare majority on the FTC, could make such a ruling, isn't that something that Congress should be concerned about how much power you wield? So we make these determinations pursuant to authority that Congress has given us. Uh, when we promulgate rules pursuant to the Administrative Procedure Act, there are a whole set of procedural protections that go into play relating to the comment periods that we have to use to get public input. Uh, there are certain standards of review uh, for judicial review. There are so many checks as part of this process, and you know it's really quite regular for administrative agencies to be engaging in rulemaking. But, but you get to say what's unfair, right? So interestingly, Congress, when passing the FTC Act, was having a debate. They said, should we actually define, should we list out in the statute all the practices that should be unfair? And Congress determines, you know, businesses are so innovative, they'll find ways to do an end run around any of the practices we list. Let's allow the FTC to use their expertise to make sure that as markets are evolving, as business trends are evolving, uh, that they can make sure that their statutory authority is keeping pace. So this was a determination and a decision that Congress made to use that language, and you know we, we follow the text of the law. Thank you, ma'am. I wish I had more time. I yield back. Recognize the gentlewoman from Vermont. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I begin my line of questioning, I just want to make note of something. Our, our Republican colleagues have touched a few times today on the words of a third-party auditor who was deposed as part of the Twitter lawsuit. And I think it's really important to point out, uh, for the sake of transparency, that this deposition was filed last night, and here we are talking about it today. I believe in coincidence, I really do, uh, but that's a pretty lucky coincidence that a pretty, um, that, that evidence supposedly providing the Republican accusations today uh, was released in, in such a timely manner. So I think it's really important to make note of that. Chair Khan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being here to the, to the bitter end. I really appreciate um, your testimony this morning. I'd like to touch on a uh, extremely timely and controversial issue, which is artificial intelligence. And specifically, I'd like your thoughts on generative AI and competition. It's tough to imagine online platforms gaining even more power uh, but it seems that big tech firms who control their own AI systems and access to cloud data are in a position to do just that. And I find that alarming, as do many of my constituents back in Vermont. So what I'd like to ask you is, how could AI technology lead to an even more consolidated internet landscape with even fewer choices for consumers? So Congresswoman, let me say first of all, these moments of technological disruption, when you have these game-changing technologies enter the market, these moments oftentimes provide a lot of opportunity for disruption and for displacing some of the existing incumbents and giants. And so there's always a chance that that'll be the effect. I think you're right that with these technologies, we see inputs required, uh, required <laughs> here that really favor dominance and favor scale. Uh, so, you know, you need huge amounts of compute, you need access to huge amounts of data, you know, the models. Uh, our staff recently published a blog post laid, laying out what some of these competition concerns could be. But I think you're absolutely right that we all need to be very vigilant to make sure that this potentially transform, transformative technology uh, is not further consolidating market power in ways that could really harm competition. And how would a firm use AI and cloud access to illegally expand their, their market power? What would that look like? So, you know, I don't want to engage in hypotheticals, but, you know, the types of, um, as we lay out in the blog post, you know, traditionally the types of concerns that you might have is if 
uh, firms with market power are conditioning access to one set of technologies and critical inputs on firms having to also buy other services, uh, those types of tying agreements, and especially when they're having an exclusionary effect, uh, can be concerning under the antitrust laws. And are you concerned about this issue in relation to the digital markets? In general, we're, we're very concerned about competition in digital markets, yes. Okay, and my last uh, time here, I also wanted to touch on another issue, which is dark patterns. Um, you know, Amazon Prime has reached a point where it's practically impossible to avoid. Uh, FTC recently took Amazon to task for using a series of digital tricks or dark patterns to enroll people in Prime without their consent or to prevent people from canceling their subscription. And this is something that I hear a lot uh, from my constituents about. Last year, the agency reported that, quote, more and more companies are using digital dark patterns to trick people into buying products and giving away their personal information. How common is it for online companies to use these dark patterns? Unfortunately, through our work, we've seen that it is too common uh, that we see companies using these tricks. Uh, we, our staff published a report um, going into detail about the different types of dark patterns that we see, which in practice end up tricking or manipulating people uh, into making choices that they're not really seeking to make. And so we want to make sure that we're fully grasping how these dark patterns are working. We've been bringing on board a whole set of technologists that are able to kind of dig deep, look under the hood, figure out what's really going on. And so it's going to continue to be an area of focus for us. And something that you said there really, really struck me. It is essentially about taking away people's choice. When you're not transparent about the ways in which consumers are being entrapped into signing up for something or not being able to cancel something. That is taking away their ability to vote with their dollars, essentially, which is something we've heard about in this hearing today. What effect does this then have on competition and privacy and innovation, just briefly? So we want to make sure that companies are competing on honesty. Uh, we don't want honest businesses to lose out to firms that are engaging in dark patterns and these types of you know, deceptive practices. So there's a consumer protection dimension to it, but as you noted, there's also a competition dimension. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you for being here today and for your patience. I disagree with the bitter end phraseology that was used. I think the entire conversation has been extraordinarily interesting, and I appreciate your being here to share your thoughts. Uh, I'm a, I'll, I'll set this up with a standard question. Uh, do you agree with the following statement from former Commissioner Wilson? The agency lacks the expertise, and in some cases, the jurisdiction to pursue the additional societal goals embodied in the strategic plan. And, and uh, jumping just to, to the phrase, unwarranted health, safety, and privacy risks. Um, I'm actually looking at the plan right now. Uh, for example, unwarranted health, safety, and privacy risks. Tell me how that those became part of the focus of the FTC? Because that seems to be an expansion of, of what the FTC used to focus upon. Or maybe I'm wrong, but uh, that's not my question to set up, my first one. Uh, so I think you said unwarranted safety, health, and privacy risks. Is that right? Yeah, actually, I'm just reading from the FTC focuses on investigating and litigating conduct that causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to the public. This includes not only monetary injury, but also, mm. for example, unwarranted health, safety, and privacy risks. So the statute says that an unfair practice is one that causes, one of the prongs is substantial injury. Uh, substantial injury is not defined, but for years now, the FTC has interpreted that and courts have ratified that to mean not just monetary harm, not just losing money, uh, but certain types of harm to wellness and self safety and health. Uh, so some of the deceptive advertising cases. Is it, or, are you referring to courts? Is that where you that's said right. that? That's right. Okay, so if, just because I want to move on. Sure. Uh, you, if you could provide me with the cases that you're referring to, uh, please. Uh, so that I can see the courts that you're relying upon for that, that, that effort. Now, let me slide that aside and let me go to the next issue. This is one, of course, that you brought up in your, your famous paper, uh, the um, Amazon antitrust paradox. And the issue is, uh, and forgive me, I'm not an expert in this space. I didn't even take this class in law school. So my, my question, antitrust, so my question is, uh, what if not the uh, consumer welfare standard, uh, what standard? 
and I'm, I'm basically lifting this right out of Bork's book, uh, about 25 hours I'll never get back, uh, that I want to spend reading it. And my question to you is, if not that standard, what standard are you going to apply? Or do you still apply just that sole standard in determining uh, the challenges that uh, bigness uh, uh, creates? So we apply the text of the statutes that Congress passed, and we look closely at the language in the statutes that Congress passed, consistent with legal precedent. Uh, there are some case if, holdings if, if, related. If, if, if I may, yep. if I recall correctly, before Burke's learned treatise, uh, there was a, a mishmash of legal precedent. You could select among almost any standard. And that's one of the reasons he was so clear in stating what he thought would be the proper standard, and that is the best for the consumer. So I'm asking you, if you're going to move away from that standard, which he so artfully articulates in his book, uh, what, what is the new standard? So we're focused on the law, including the case law, wait, 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 not wait, wait, on the wait, 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 wait. I just pointed out that before Bork, there was any number of standards. Just grab one. So when you say you're looking at the law, which law? The Sherman Act, the Clayton Act, the FTC Act, yeah, so look, those the are Those are extraordinarily, they were, they were written to be very broad and to give you uh, the, the power to try to control this, this uh, economy that we've got. Bork went in and tried to find some, some sort of a, create some sort of a standard against which you could measure your actions. And, and his ideas were, were accepted. I think uh, your, your article, you know this way better than anybody in this room. So my question is, what's the new standard? Don't, please don't take me into the law. And that's, don't do that. Tell me, what, what do you have that's better than what Bork suggested? So in instances where the Supreme Court has said, for example, that the Sherman Act should be interpreted consistent with consumer welfare, you know, of course we look closely at that. But the Sherman Act is not the only statute, right? For the FTC, we're charged with prohibiting unfair methods of competition. And I think it's incredibly important for us to honor Congress's intent wait, in creating wait, wait, multiple- Wait, 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 stop. Your lot of generalizations, what's the standard that you are suggesting to take the place of the consumer welfare? What, which, what's your standard? Please don't give me generalizations. So the standard depends on the statute that we're enforcing because each statutory scheme is slightly different. When we're enforcing the FTC Act, the words of the FTC Act are unfair methods of competition. That's the standard we're, we're enforcing. We laid out a policy statement last year that laid out in very clear, uh, in, in great detail, what that standard means, reflecting a century of case law. So, so, so I'm out of time, but I will look at your uh, explanation, and I appreciate your time here today. Thank you. We are going to take a five-minute recess, and we're going to strictly adhere to that. It will be five minutes.
Florida. I'm sorry, my God. <laughs> Thank both, you, Mr. Both the Texas folks and the Florida folks are going to get mad at me now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, Chair Khan. I'd like to focus our attention on the recent notice of rulemaking and proposed changes to the pre-merger notification form requirements and instructions. Uh, so this new proposed rule would require submission of substantial additional documents uh, from what is currently the status quo, uh, including uh, draft agreements and term sheets as opposed to just the final proposal for review, uh, information about creditors, minority shareholders, officers, directors, uh, and information on labor markets, data about workforce, including geographic information about employees, uh, and details about prior penalties and findings by the NLRB. Is that right? Among other things. Yes, we issued a proposal um, of uh, you know, suggestions for additional information that we'd be getting. Uh, another key area would be foreign subsidies. So Congress told us to get information about whether firms that are looking to merge are getting subsidies from China or so, other countries. Thank you. But in summary, this proposed rule would substantially expand the types and volumes of documents and information that are being submitted uh, as part of this pre-merger review process, correct? That's right. Okay, and we also know that this rule, this new rule, if, if, if adopted, would substantially affect the time and the cost associated for entities who want to participate and make submissions under the pre-merger uh, review process, correct? Yes, people would have to comply with the new form, which is seeking additional information. Right, and your agency, in fact, has estimated that uh, this would increase by over 100 hours the time necessary to compile uh, compliance documents to make this submission, uh, and in some cases, in, the, in some of the more complex or larger cases, uh, even much more than the 100 hours, correct? These are some of the estimates in the NPRM, yes. Yes. And the internal estimate also identified a cost uh, estimated of $350 million impact for the change in the rule for compliance. Is that right? That's on the higher end. I mean, I will say a lot of this will depend on the complexity of the transaction. If you're seeing a merger between two fairly small firms that don't have any, you know, complex holdings or that sort of thing, uh, I imagine it would be much less. But you just raised a very interesting point, and it was one of the things that I wanted to ask about. So if we know going in that the time and the cost now associated with this pre-merger review process, the time's going to increase, the cost is going to increase, uh, you know, won't this affect the businesses that are at the lowest end of the reporting thresholds the most? Uh, they would be the least able to incur uh, those costs and time without it affecting uh, their overall margins? So again, it really will depend on the complexity of the merger. Um, if it's a fairly simple transaction, I imagine it will be much easier to comply. I should also note, this is all about what firms need to produce on the front end, and it's our belief that by getting more information on day one, that'll allow us to more efficiently and effectively administer the laws in ways that could create more certainty for businesses on the back end. But at the conceptual to... level, the large corporations, the ones in fact that I believe you're probably the most concerned about, the very largest corporations are the ones who are the most capable of saying, yep, yeah, let's bring in our outside counsel and spend a few couple more hundred hours or let's allocate additional costs to go through this process. They would be the ones who could most easily absorb this change as opposed to the, the smaller entities at the lower end of that threshold. Um, now, let's go here. So by expanding the types of documents, by the types of information that you all are reviewing uh, in assessing whether a merger should be approved and allowed to proceed, um, you're really expanding the, the bases upon which the FTC could choose to approve, seek more information, or disapprove, are you not? We're still squarely focused on whether the merger would may substantially lessen competition or tend to create the monopoly. That remains our legal standard. Uh, we're seeking. How is it that some of the information that you're requesting, though, such as demographic information about employees or uh, information about shareholders and officers, how would that relate back to that core mission that you all have been pursuing prior to now? So issues relating to um, officers or things like potentially, you know overlapping directorates, uh, those can affect, for example, uh, Section 8 of the Clayton Act in terms of if you have interlocking directorates. So those are some issues in which 
you know, they're squarely within the confines of the antitrust laws. So let me ask this then. The proposed rule, it's something that you all have, have, have developed in essence because you believe it would have a significant impact, correct, on mergers, on the health of the economy, on businesses. Uh, you're pursuing this because you think it's meaningful, correct? We're pursuing it because we think it'll allow the FTC to administer the laws that Congress has charged us with more effectively and efficiently. So you believe it's consequential? Go ahead. Uh, we Last think question. it'll meaningfully enable the FTC to do its job, yes. But without a specific mandate from Congress to engage in this behavior, correct? I disagree with that. The Hart Scott Rodino Act uh, allows the agencies uh, to get information on the front end when firms governed by this law are required to do so, and we're acting pursuant to that authority. Time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Recognize the gentlelady from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Khan, being here. So I want to bring a few issues, and I would like you to respond. But first, um, you know, I belong to a group of people, even though I very much agree with Mr. Tiffany that majority of monopoly problems, problems which are significant because we created this monopolies, incentivize this monopoly. And unfortunately, we created more companies now, too big to fail. And all of the laws that we try to deal with them, including like Dodd-Frank, Act, which I was actually work, one of the implementers when I work in public accounting, now created this institution even bigger. And now we're going to be dealing with that. But I also understand that there are two now, some of the areas where we have now problems so big that it involves us to look in at the barriers of entry, like healthcare, and then look in what are we going to deal with now with these monopolies that are distorting the market and using very aggressive behaviors to suppress consumer, to suppress competitors, and really not deliver in value because they can't. They are not natural monopoly. We create it, and we have to look at that. So I think your agency has an important function, but unfortunately, and I want you to really respond on that, we have a lot of concerns from the Republican side, and that agency has been politicized, and agency has been used to really you know, the hammer and sickle and, you know, to actually pick, you know, a kind of in fashion to pick losers and winners. And I think, you know, it's becoming a problem. And if you look at your even, you know, the missions that you have and objectives, you said we really need to have more, you know, uh, merge together consumer protection competition and you want to you know your agency shapes distribution of power I truly don't believe that that is an agency I think the agency should be you know dealing with the really abuses in the system that want to not have competition, use monopolistic power. So even in the statements, it's a problem. And uh, I would like, I think we have one common ground that it seems like a lot of time we have a lot of talk is on healthcare. But when we come to the action, it's even recently, you know, we put it on the table with President Biden's administration on dealing with, you know, with site neutral tape payments and hospitals that bankrupt in Medicare, total abuse of power, allow them to buy private practices, allow them to put these doctors in crazy non-competes and slave them, you know, build in Taj Mahal's, not paying taxes, invest in billions on Wall Street and pay billions to executives by subsidies that are now countries going bankrupt on because a third of our spending is healthcare, not the in value, you know, they didn't want to deal with that, you know. And then you have a challenge now because a lot of these entities, nonprofit, which is really doesn't even have guidance, that's that like next business I'm going to have is going to be tax exempt. You know, you don't have a full jurisdiction to deal with these entities, and no one has, and you, I would like you to deal with that. But now my colleagues here have a concern. So, you know, we have actually a bipartisan bill, but a lot of my people here feel concerned with you that you're not going to be enforcing it properly, and you will use it as a power, you know, to actually pick losers and winners again. So I wanted you to see how you can respond you know, with what you're doing in this area, you know, I think there is a PBM probably common ground. We have that area. But if we look at that, 50 to 60 percent of spend is, you know, hospitals and physicians, 5 to 10 is actually only spent on drugs. So this is a huge amount of money. How would you respond what you're doing on that and how you would address some of these Republican concerns? Because I think your agency has some functions. But unfortunately, everything got so politicized and a lot of people here on my side of the aisle don't feel comfortable to give any more power to your agency. 
Thanks for the question, Congresswoman. Um, you're absolutely right. We have a whole set of work streams underway relating to healthcare markets. Uh, we're concerned about instances in which monopolistic practices or a lack of competition in healthcare markets uh, may be rising, raising prices for consumers, uh, may be depriving them of access to quality healthcare. Uh, our teams have for many years now been challenging hospital mergers uh, where they've determined that the merger would either raise prices or um, you know, lessen competition in ways that was harming patients. We have un work underway, as we've talked about extensively today, relating to PBMs uh, and the potential conflicts of interest that are created through their vertical integration, as well as issues that may be created through the rebate schemes that they have in place. Uh, we also have work looking more directly at drug prices and whether you know, mergers and acquisitions done by pharmaceutical companies uh, maybe inhibiting innovation, maybe keeping lower cost alternatives out of the hands of American patients. Um, so that's all work that we have underway and we're working hard to, to move quickly on all of that. Uh, my time has expired, but we still need to figure out how you can address concerns of my colleague. So I'm gonna yield back. The gentlelady yields back. I re recognize the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's good to have you here today. I, I'd like to talk about the Horse Racing Integrity and, Safe and Safety Act. Um, well, it's called the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, uh, which Congress created and put under your um, commission's rulemaking authority. I know you didn't ask for this, but you got it. And I've got some questions. They're not complaints directed toward you or your leadership, but I just um, uh, like to say that I'm very disappointed in how they have operated. Uh, it, the HISA was intended to improve safety and fairness in horse racing. It's fallen short of its promises. And some of the issues I have, I'm not even sure you're aware of. Uh, and when I'm done, I want to ask that we can sit down and talk about it more. But the FTC um, has allowed them to operate in a way that they are making rules, um, I believe, uh, without the authority um, or without any oversight. Uh, there's also a budget of $66 million. My question is, does the FTC monitor how these funds are being spent and who the recipient of their budget funds are going to? So the statutory scheme lays out the relationship between the FTC um, and this kind of self-regulatory organization. Um, you're right that we didn't ask for this authority. Uh, to be honest, it's been a bit of a challenge for us fully implementing it. We don't have real deep expertise in this area. Um, on your specific question, to be honest, I'm not totally sure. I don't think we have that authority to be overseeing how they use their money. Okay. I'm happy to um, get back to you on that. Separately, if the FTC enforcement staff was investigating an antitrust case and thought it needed to conduct a search of a business's premise, would the FTC need a search warrant for that search? Um, presumably, though I do know that I believe it's Section 9 of the FTC Act does give uh, the FTC ability to, you know, engage in some of that activity as well. All right. I would just uh, let you know that this uh, authority under your, um, your supervision uh, can conduct a search without a warrant. They can also impose an immediate suspension on horses and trainers and owners if there's any evidence or suspicion of, of doping. One of the reasons they were created was because of the deaths in the horse racing um, in the past, but we've seen just this year um, that even more deaths have, have happened, and I would make a case that this authority is uh, poorly run and operating um, in a way that I suspect if you all um, really knew, you would disapprove of. I'd like to sit and talk with you all about that um, after this hearing down the road. Moving on, I want to talk about uh, some of the mergers and uh, the policies uh, with respect to those. Um, I'm specifically curious, because I'm looking at a letter uh, that Senator Warren sent you all in January of this year about some pharmaceutical mergers. How much interaction does her staff or, or, or her have with you all with respect to these? Do they have um, influence with the direction you all go on some of these investigations? Congressman, we hear routinely from members of Congress. Uh, we get letter week after week, including from many members of this committee. Uh, we take all of that under advisement uh, and want to understand what our members' concerns, but any law enforcement decisions that we're making, we're making on an independent basis based on the facts and law before us. Well, I'm, I'm looking at particularly the Amgen and Horizon merger, uh, which I understand was moving along pretty, pretty well. And the, it's different than some of these mergers uh, that she mentions in this letter that I'm reading. And I, I know you all probably have a copy. I'll uh, get, get you one if you don't. 
Um, but Horizon is an Irish company. It's a kind of a special case because it inverted in 2014 by acquiring this Irish company. So they actually left the U.S. Um, to, for tax benefits. And now Amgen, as I understand it, is looking to um, acquire this company. They, uh, they're involved in totally different drugs. And what this would do is actually bring a company back to the United States, which I, I believe is a goal that we all share, is bringing industry here at home. Um, so I would also uh, ask, especially since it seems uh, to have been stopped right after Senator Warren sent this letter, um, if I could sit down with you all at some point and we talk about this one as well. Can we, can we commit to doing that? We'll be happy to have a follow-up conversation with you. Yes, Congressman. I appreciate uh, your work, and thank you very much uh, for being here. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. We are going to take a recess when we have to vote. As soon as votes are completed, we will be back. Thank you. You're going to get a longer recess now.
There's another hearing. That's true.
Call the meeting back into order. Uh, we will start with the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kahn, um, would like to talk to you about something you said earlier today when you were talking with Mr. Massey. You said, quote, uh, we do things to make sure that the market has clarity. Uh, to make sure that the market has clarity was the quote I wrote down from you. And, and I was glad you brought that up because the Second Circuit, as you know, back in 1984, said of the FTC, quote, the commission owes a duty to define the conditions under which conduct would be unfair so that businesses will have an inkling as to what they are lawfully, what they can lawfully do rather than be left in a state of complete unpredictability. But by moving away from the consumer welfare standard, uh, I would posit that the FTC has effectively created uh, a moving goalpost standard. And Mr. Bentz pressed you on that several, with several questions, and you just said, well, basically, it kind of depends. Case by case, we're going to look at different laws. Is, is that effectively the summary of what you said and, and the, the guidance that was provided last year in the policy statement regarding the scope of unfair methods of competition under Section 5 of the FTC? So Section 5 of the FTC Act is a different statutory scheme than the Sherman Act, and so we look at case law that's specific to Section 5 and specific to the FTC Act when interpreting that provision. With respect to that November 10th, 2022 um, dissenting statement of Commissioner Christine Wilson as it relates to that Section 5 of the FTC and the policy statement, she stated this, 
Uh, quote, unfortunately, instead of providing meaningful guidance to businesses, the policy statement announces that the commission has the authority summarily to condemn essentially any business conduct it finds distasteful. Uh, did it concern you that one of the commissioners would, uh, would issue such a statement and reach such a conclusion? So the benefits of having a multi-member commission is that we can have that discussion and debate and disagreement. And, you know, we always take seriously input that we're getting from other, other members of the commission. Uh, as you'll see in the policy statement itself, it has reflects decades of case law that our team took a very close look at to make sure that we were hewing very closely to this text of the statute as well as the relevant precedent. With respect to the early terminations issue that uh, Mr. Benz talked to you about earlier, I sent you a letter earlier this year about that issue, uh, and you wrote in response that granting early terminations causes or consumes agency resources. Can you explain how reinstating the early terminations diverts agency resources? Sure, so we, our staff is reviewing merger filings, they're in the process of litigating, they're investigating. When they are looking at the HSR filings, their primary goal, our statutory mandate, is to be identifying transactions that may violate the Clayton Act or any of the other antitrust laws. Granting early termination is a discretionary function and so we decide to put resources towards the mandatory functions in the statute over the discretionary ones. But, but for years, that early termination policy allowed the FTC to allow uh, mergers and acquisitions of a small size or a size where there was really no uh, competition issue uh, really presented for you to go ahead and give surety to those businesses that they could proceed with those mergers and acquisitions. But that's no longer the case in the FTC, right? You're, you're holding businesses in limbo because you're giving them these letters and saying, well, we're, we're going to look at it. We're, we're not sure. But then businesses have trouble moving forward with those mergers and acquisitions because sometimes the financing is tied up in the time frame that they need a quick M&A. Is that, is that true or is that untrue? So, Congressman, the context here is we're talking about 30 days. 30 days the firms have to wait before they're able to consummate if they don't hear from the agencies. In the past, maybe firms would have gotten early termination on day 25. Now they're not getting it, but after day 30, they're able to consummate. So we've decided that as a matter of where we're allocating our resources, it's a better use of resources to be identifying which transactions may be creating problems for consumers, for workers, for honest businesses, rather than prioritize the kind of five days that firms may have um, gotten in the past. It, it seems that uh, a lot of the resources, when you talk about allocation of resources, have been going towards new rulemaking in the FTC, rather than actually working through some of these issues that you guys are looking at, some of which you should be looking at, some of which you probably shouldn't be looking at. Uh, is, is that the reason why in 2020 the FTC brought 31 challenges to mergers, which was a two-decade high, but in 2021, the year you became chair, the FTC took only 15 actions against mergers, and in 2022, only 17 actions. Is that because you're focused too much on rulemaking and all your resources are allocated in that direction? So there are no real, I mean, we have look, we're proposed a rule to update the HSR form in the Bureau of Competition, but aside from that, the vast majority of resources are focused on enforcement. Um, I think some of those numbers you mentioned are outdated. Uh, our team would be happy to provide you with updated numbers. Our enforcement is squarely in line with prior years. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I recognize Mr. Hunt from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here, man. I really appreciate your time. It must have been kind of a long day. Um, first question for you is, uh, on July 13th, uh, 2022, uh, the FTC proposed the Motor Vehicle Dealers Trade Regulation Rule. Are you familiar with this rule? Yes. Okay. Uh, did, the FTC, did the FTC conduct a cost-benefit analysis for this rule and determine what cost of implementing this rule might be, and what did the cost-benefit analysis conclude, if you can recall? So we did have to conduct that analysis pursuant to the Administrative Procedure Act, and the you know notice of proposed rulemaking lays out some of that preliminary analysis. Any idea on the cost? I'm not recalling off the top. Okay. I'd like to ask for uh, unanimous consent, sir, to end this into the record. Uh, this is a, a research study that's done by the Center of Automotive Research, uh, which conducted that a full cost-benefit analysis of this rule and determined that the rule would impose a cost of $38 billion with a B over the next 10 years. Are you that, familiar with that at all? That, that objection. 
Thank you. This is a study done by some outsiders, you said, or this is the FTC analysis? No, this is, this, this is actually an, out, an outsider, the Center of Automotive Research. I'm not familiar with it. I know we got a lot of comments on the rules, so our teams are looking at those closely. Maybe this was one of those. So what we'll do is we will send this to you. I, I would implore you to take a look at it. And now that you have a copy of it, I would love for you to reconsider um, that burden and that cost that it would actually place on the American people, if you don't mind. Happy to. I mean, I will say generally the auto rule that we've proposed is designed to address junk fees, bait and switch tactics, some of the harms that consumers time and time again have been encountering in these contexts. We received over 100,000 complaints from consumers over the last few years mm -hmm. relating to some of these deceptive practices in the auto purchasing context. So that's what our rule is really designed to address. Okay, understood. And I think this is kind of what our goal is to make sure that we prevent any undue burden on the American people. Obviously, the issue that you just addressed, and also most importantly, just cost, because right now we as a country are suffering immensely with inflation, everything that we've been seeing. So I wanna make sure that we do protect the American uh, voter here in this country. Uh, switching gears, the FTC has made a mandate protecting uh, consumers and their privacy. Under that mandate, do you think it's appropriate for the FTC to compel a company to collect and retain consumer data, including their personal identifiable information? Is there a particular context you're thinking about, Congressman? There is a particular context, but I'm just kind of wondering what your overall feel, is it, feel of this issue is. I can't, I can't exactly say who asked this question for their, for their own uh, uh, anonymity, but I was just wondering what your overall feel is about including their data that has their personal information in it as the FTC. Overall, the goal of our data privacy and security is to protect the privacy and security of Americans' data. Uh, what ultimate remedy or relief we're seeking is generally, generally speaking designed to minimize the data being collected. I'm not sure with what specific instance you're referencing. I understand. Uh, and, last, and last question, uh, do you think it's appropriate to suspend the collection of this data in the name of protecting consumer data as a whole? Again, would be happy to look at any specific matter that you're considering, but uh, a key goal of some of our recent privacy work has been data minimization to really okay. limit what data is being collected in the first instance, because we've seen that that's the best way to minimize risk of privacy breaches and security breaches. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I yield back the rest of my time. Gentlemen yields. Recognize the gentleman from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Khan, thank you for being here. Uh, I know it's been a long day. You know, the FTC's mission is to protect the public from deceptive and unfair trade practices and from unfair methods of competition. Even on your website, the FTC's work to protect consumers and promote competition touches the economic life of all of us. Um, I'd say the FTC is charged with a very important mission uh, and have for a long time. A Bloomberg report recently found that 71 attorneys left the agency in a two-year period between 21 and 22. This is the highest number of departures in 20 years. Um, that being said, it's pretty tough, I would imagine, to protect the American consumer and promote competition uh, when your staff is leaving. As you know, Congress receives federal employee uh, viewpoint surveys, or FEVSs, to inform us uh, on how agencies are functioning. In 2020, 87% uh, of FTC employees agreed that senior leaders maintain high standards of honesty and integrity. And in two years, uh, that dropped from 50 to 53%, and also uh, in 22 to 49%. Similarly, in 2020, 83% of FTC employees agreed that they have the highest level of respect for FTC's senior leaders. Again, in 21, that dropped to 49%, and in 22, to 44%. In, 20, um, in 2020, again, 80% of FTC respondents agreed that senior leaders generate high levels of motivation and commitment in the workforce. Under your leadership, that has dropped to 42% in 21, and 40, or 36%, alarmingly, in 2022. So I think my question, quite frankly, is why is it so unpopular to work at the FTC? So we have fantastic career staff who day in, day out are fighting for the American people and looking to protect them from unlawful business practices. Uh, I take those survey results seriously and we've been engaged in taking a series of steps to make sure that the FTC is a great place to work. Uh, I've been really thrilled that over the last couple of years we've been able to onboard hundreds of new employees at the FTC. Just the other month, we launched a new office of technology. Within a matter of a week, we got 600 applications 
technologists, these are data scientists, data engineers, highly qualified people who want to come work at the FTC to make sure that we're able to use their technological expertise as we continue to do our work to protect the American public. Well, Chair, I would imagine with the, the high number of vacancies that have been um, as a result of the last two years that, that, that you would be hiring more people in addition to the, I think, 33% increase in your budget. So I would imagine that there is a drive to hire people just in general to fill those spots. But I think my concern is the unhappiness of people within the agency and why that is. Do you care to comment on that? Yeah, I take that very seriously. And, you know, we've engaged in a lot of conversations and meetings to understand what some of the source of those issues were. We've been able to implement a set of steps, including streamlining decision making, uh, expanding communications around priorities. Uh, we clarified what our workplace uh, flexibility policies would be. And I'm hopeful that each of those steps has contributed. Yeah, and Chair, please don't take my comments as, as me um, attacking you or your agency, but it is a concern to me that when I read that, of course, you know, my colleagues up here have, have uh, echoed a lot of policy frustrations with your organization, maybe you, uh, but when I'm reading about employee satisfaction, I mean, they, the FTC serves such a vital purpose in our country, um, it's just really alarming to see it go from one of the top performing agencies of employee satisfaction to really the bottom. Um, in a two-year period. It's just really alarming. So um, what do you think that you've learned? I mean, you've been here for two years uh, from, and you've seen, you know, some tumultuous times. Do you think you've learned anything as a result of uh, maybe your leadership or leadership around you on how to, to handle this and correct it? So as I said, we, you know, undertook um, a set of steps to make sure we were appropriately streamlining decision-making, uh, expanding communications, uh, with staff across the agency. Um, in terms of learnings, you know, I've had the privilege of seeing firsthand just how hard FTC staff are working day in, day out. Uh, oftentimes they're having to go up against companies that are, whose resources really dwarf ours. And, you know, there's a clear mismatch in resources, but we're still able to go toe to toe on talent. And that just reflects the, the sheer talent and dedication of our staff. Well, good, and I, and I hope that these issues correct. There's a lot, of, I think Ms. Mr. Gates talked about an important issue about creepy data collection that's going on. You've hit on that all day. Um, the mission is important, but you have to correct the ship. You have to correct the type of management that you perform, and I think that starts with you. That starts with your team, uh, because I don't want to read about toxic environments or people feeling like they're not heard or mismanagement at the highest levels. There has been a lot a lot of, of ups and downs with the FTC over the last two years, and I'm hopeful that you can correct that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I yield five minutes to myself. Um, I just wanted to take up a little bit where Congressman Biggs and Congressman Johnson were speaking, um, talking about the diversity, equity, inclusion issue that Commissioner Slaughter um, has evidently championed. Do you believe... And, and I know it's hard, but if you could just give me a yes or no answer, do you believe that should be a major and significant part of antitrust enforcement? Do you believe that's your job? So our job is to enforce the antitrust laws, which prohibit unfair methods of competition or deals that substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. Uh, we endeavor to do that work so, to protect everybody. So what does that have to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion? I'm not really sure. I mean, could you share more about what your specific concerns are? Well, Commissioner Slaughter has said, and we have quotes, that this needs to be have a major role in antitrust enforcement, that that's a very major piece of it, that it's part of it. Do you, do you agree with that or not? I didn't think, in all honesty, there are agencies who have that job and that responsibility. I didn't believe that yours did, but I, I was just, you know, concerned, are we going to, as it is you're short of resources, we can't do all the things we want to do to protect the consumer. I don't know why we would divert resources, time, energy, and, and people power to actually going forward with that. Yeah, look, I won't speak on behalf of my colleague. I mean, again, what I, what I think about is the ways in which concentration of economic power and monopoly power hurts everybody. I understand. And we need to keep that in mind as we're using these tools and making sure we're protecting all, all parts of the American public from these practices. I agree. Um, I'm concerned, and I'm just picking up where Congressman Fry left off on some of the state of morale at the FTC since you began your tenure. Examples such as hiring a chief of staff described as frequently 
creating friction with a, an aggressive managerial style. We're choosing an associate director for litigation in the Bureau of Competition with less than two years of legal experience before joining your office as a high-ranking member. Um, can you speak on that for just a moment? Yeah, I'm really lucky to have a fantastic senior You leadership. do have good staff. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you do have a good staff. But some things, and let me, let me say this just to maybe clarify this more. On the matter of agency morale, the Bureau of Competition, which you're familiar with, whose mission is to enforce the nation's antitrust laws, one of your top priorities, and I believe it is, saw its engagement and satisfaction score drop by 33% since you began your tenure. Do you think that's a result of your leadership style? Is it a result of something else? Or are there other factors that are affecting FTC employees? You do have some, a lot of great people there, but the point is a lot of those great people have also expressed that they're not happy. Why? And I couldn't agree more that it's important for us to understand what some of the source um, of those numbers are. And as we've been looking to do, and I should also note, I mean, for the Bureau of Competition in particular, you know, over the last couple of years, they've been on the front lines of a surge in merger filings. I mean, you know, year over year, they were seeing a 70% increase in the number of filings coming in while I, their numbers- I understand that, so, but they're so not happy. We have a lot of people that work very hard, but they're happy. Just to commend them, of course. And so we've been looking to understand, again, what more can we be doing- So you're working on this? Correct. Okay, you think it's gonna get better? I'm hopeful. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about unpaid consultants for a moment, which the Office of the Inspector General, this was not me saying this, the Inspector General said this, labeled as, quote, unprecedented, end quote. The Inspector General report from last year said you didn't give these consultants clear guidance or limits. I'm not saying it. This is not a Republican saying it or a Democrat or anybody else on their work and that there was concern that these practices may, quote, violate policies for federal agencies that stipulate that such agencies, these hires are not allowed to play an inherently, quote, an inherently governmental function. Can you tell us how many of these consultants are working at the FTC, what they're doing, and how often you meet with them? So there is federal authority allowing government agencies to make use of some of these consultants, um, especially in areas where I, we don't have existing experts. Respectfully, I understand that. We're running out of time. Why did the Inspector General s so sound an inspector, alarm, though? The Inspector General's report identified certain areas where we could be tightening up our processes and procedures to make sure we're mitigating against risk. We followed very closely the IG's recommendations and have been moving forward to implement those recommendations. Okay. I have items for the record. Uh, I have two articles from the Americans for Tax Reform titled, quote, Linda Kahn has some explaining to do, end quote, as well as Kahn reveals that she, quote, handpicked controversial unpaid consultants. Um, thank you for your answers. I'm going to yield back uh, with that. I think that will conclude today's hearing. We thank our witnesses for appearing before the committee. We thank you for being here. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Without objection, this hearing is adjourned.